Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's Tuesday. It's July 18th. I can't believe we're getting towards the end of July. I feel like the summer has gone zooming by, but that's primarily because my kids start school really early in August. Um, If I look like I am glistening, it's because I decided to go for a walk outside this morning, forgetting that that means I will be glistening for at least three more hours today. But it felt really good to just get outside for a moment. Today, we are talking about uh, copyright strikes and toxic gossip trains. I've gotten a lot of questions about the Michael Turney um, uh, ruling yesterday. I'm going to just talk about the ruling in general. It's not a case I followed, so I can't dive into specifics, but I'm going to talk about how that happens in a trial, what it means. And then we're going to spend most of today's show talking about Alec Murdoch, not the pictures on the internet. Do not Google. Do not Google. Do My eyes cannot unsee. Um, shirtless photos of Alec Murdoch from jail, just so you're warned. So we're going to talk about Murdoch, not the photos, but we're going to talk about the Mallory Beach hearing and then the Mallory Beach settlement. Yesterday when I was recording the Emily Show podcast with the members only behind the scenes, so many of you wanted to go over the Mallory Beach court hearing. I think you all just want to see Mark Tinsley drop the hammer in court again. So I, um, I'm going to acquiesce to that request and we're going to watch an hour. Um, it's a little less than an hour. That hearing is about a 45 minute hearing and a ruling and that hearing and ruling, um, ties into the Mallory Beach settlement and there's new motions in the Mallory Beach case with regard to Alec Murdoch. There's another civil suit. So we need, there's like a lot of litigation going on. So we're going to cover all of that. But first, we're going to get into, well, copyright and toxic gossip trains. We have to talk about it. Replay crew, you know, I love you. Everything will be linked down below. And I'm going to tell you about some uh, interesting news I got this week, too, as we get into it. So I'm going to roll the intro. What are you guys drinking? Where are you coming in from? I have an iced coffee against advisement. I have hot water for my throat. So hopefully it doesn't get all gunky at me. And then we have a George hiding in the window because George enjoys watching the birds outside my window as much as I do. I think the Cardinals are his favorite. Uh, They might be mine too, but maybe it's just because they're really easy to see when they go, when they go zooming past all the green. So that's what we're doing. Good to see where you guys are coming in from. Let's law nerds. Let's get going. Oh, I don't have the right intro up. (laughs) It's real early for we're professionals here. Real early. Real, real early. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not Let's get into it. To see so many of you from all around the world. I know it's not coffee time for everybody. For a lot of you, it's hydration time. When I say this is the most hydrated chat on the internet, it's because it is. Y'all are amazing um, and incredible. Look, I I have been doing some like sensitivity stuff that I'm sensitive to um, to try to figure out if some of the voice stuff and gunkiness might be more allergy related. I've moved environments, so it's not unlikely to think that perhaps allergies are getting me in a different way than I experienced um, before, either food allergies or environmental allergies. So it's something I've been looking at. And one of the sensitivities that came up, y'all, and I, I think I might have to ignore this and pretend it's not happening, wants to coffee. I know I'm going to have to try some days with coffee and without coffee and see if it helps with the ick. Y'all, the way I can't handle that news, the way I can't handle that news. So on Thursday, if I'm drinking hot tea, you'll know why we're going to we're going to trade it out. We're going to see what we can do. We're going to go from bean water to leaf water and see. But coffee, I was like, no, 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 I reject that entirely. No not coffee take everything but not the co- well that's not true if they if cheese had been on the list i probably would have actually cried but i was like take everything but not my coffee no so i will i'm going to be experimenting with how it goes with and without um and so i will probably be doing more homemade coffee um I know coffee can can be moldy, Christine D. And for everyone in the chat who has said that might be the sensitivity, I have 
some very much more high quality beans at home. So this is kind of a, a little like a, a we're going to do Starbucks once in a while, once in a while. Um, and then we will do the coffee at home and see what we can do to, um, to, to deal with it. So, uh, Octo, yes, I, those are the only beans I do, you know, me. So we'll, we'll get back to less Starbucks and more grinding my own, um, grinding my own beans at home and trying some caffeinated teas and going from there. But it probably also doesn't help that I love it full of cold foam and the dairy can make you mucusy in the face. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it, but I like it. So we're going to experiment with it. So I'm just letting you know, y'all, we've got a lot going on over here. I thank you for your, your thoughts and prayers during this time. Uh, <laughs> as we navigate what's making Emily's face <laughs> gross. We're going to, we're going to keep navigating that. So uh, we'll find other ways to caffeinate. The funny thing is that I did not drink coffee until gosh i still have the first photo of my instagram when we got our coffee maker um which must have been like 2015. so i i am not like a lifelong coffee drinker because coffee used to really upset my stomach <laughs> do we see a pattern here that maybe maybe this was a problem before so i never drank coffee um until until actually well into me dealing with other health things and just being like, I'm not surviving. I need to try it. So uh, I'm just going to have to experiment. Chat, you have so many, um, so many good ideas. I love a good chai tea. So we'll see. I will just, we'll see. Um, I will definitely, I've been doing some antihistamines. Um, uh, somebody in the chat didn't listen to my, my don't Google. <laughs> Gaining wisdom. <laughs> I told you you can't unsee it. <laughs> it's like when you when you mention like I, I didn't want to bring more attention to it, but again, I can't unsee and the internet is now rife with photos. We'll talk about the Alec Murnoff photos in a minute. But first, shall we talk about uh copy claims and gossip trains? Do you want are you ready? Hold on. Let me pull up my tweet because that's where I put up the pictures of stuff and then it's easier to pull it up than on the uh than on the rest of it. So let me grab that real quick. I also put it up on my community tab. Oh, I can go there. I can just go to the community tab and pull it up. Um, all right, let's do this. So for those of you that have not been following along, okay, George, I don't know if you guys saw him go leaping down, but okay. All right, let us talk about this. I'm going to swoop. For those of you, this is Kind of a quick bits. Should we do the quick bits intro? I like it so much. We're just going to do it. Let's just do it. Quick bits. Quick bits. For those of you not following the story with regard to the toxic gossip train and copyright, let's talk about that. When um, disgraced YouTuber Colleen Bollinger first released her reaction video. I refuse to call it an apology. It's not an apology. It's a response. It is her trying to defend her actions, um, with messaging minors, sending them, um, inappropriate adult image. Oh, how far are we into the stream? Oh, eight minutes with her sending minors porn and commenting on it with her asking them about her sex life with improper, um, behavior with minors while on stage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She made a response video trying to defend herself, calling these things the toxic gossip train. Unfortunately, toxic gossip train is catchy AF, which I hate about it because in another context, it might actually be a really interesting, um, a really interesting commentary on sometimes there are things that are unfounded, but this has, you know, quite a lot of foundation in truth and evidence and she's never come forward and um and shown anything to the contrary that these uh allegations and the evidence presented is not true that if you want to see it covered you can see it covered directly from adam mcintyre who was one of the minors who was involved in all of this we um swoop has done a great documentary on it cruel world happy mind has covered it everybody else on the internet has talked about it in one way or another either through talking about this response video or talking about the allegations 
And, you know, some of these allegations border on criminal. I know Runkle broke that down in this video. Is he calling it a response or is Runkle just calling it an admission, like your admission of liability? I saw questions about whether or not you can use music um, in trials. And there are some some circumstances where you can't use things like song lyrics in trial. But this song is specifically addresses the situation. And she says, I want to address the situation. So it's not going to fall under the laws that say you can't take a general song um, that has lyrics about things that might be criminal and then impute them into a trial. But there are circumstances where a song like this is the type of song that is a direct response to things. And she acknowledges that in the video, though vaguely. So there was lots of speculation when she busted out the ukulele that is now back up in my child's room, but busted out the ukulele and sang her response uh, that she was doing so for copyright purposes. Is she doing this because there's a whole different copyright system on YouTube? How much I know about YouTube's alternate copyright system right now, the fact um, that I have learned way more about music copyright than I ever thought I needed to know and how it works on this uh, on this platform is uh, is a delight. I'm delighted, <laughs> I suppose, and I'm um, I'm interested. So I went through the differences between the copyright system on YouTube, particularly uh, the copyright system with regard to music versus regular videos, because you can copyright claim a video. What you can't do is monetization share just a video. So I get copyright notices all the time that somebody has used my video on a clip channel or what have you. I get these notices in the back end of my um, YouTube s multiple times a week sometimes. And you can either contact the channel, you can ask to have the video removed, or you can strike the channel. You kind of have three different options there. But when it comes to music, you have the option to revenue share. So if I used or reacted to a Dolly Parton song and started singing Colleen, 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 Colleen. No, that's that's more of an honor than is deserved. But if I started reacting to Dolly Parton music, um, then it would just come up as a rev share. It wouldn't take the video down. It wouldn't strike the video. It would allow for revenue sharing. Some music does that. Some music is like the fuck you're thinking this video is never going to see the light of day squash immediately. So it remembers that or it, um, it will not allow the video to even be seen or distributed. So it really depends who releases the song who is the label in charge of the song and which music clearing house is claiming the rights on the song. Some of them, some of them are cool. Dolly Parton, always cool. If you react to a Dolly video, it's gonna be revenue share. Others, um, I think BMG is one of them, others will not even allow the video to be seen. Others will claim all of the monetization. It really just depends. So with all of that, um, the H3 podcast put out that they had gotten a um, they had gotten a copy claim for revenue sharing on their video. Let me pull that up, actually, and we'll just go through all of these. So they shared that they got a copyright claim for revenue sharing on their video where they cover toxic gossip train and that that was claimed by um, by CD Baby. They also had a conversation about whether or not um, Colleen Ballinger had uploaded that video uh, to to Insta not to Instagram, to iTunes and other other locations. So when Emily add this to stream, okay. So when they got the C the claim from CD Baby on the H3 podcast, it shows the timestamp where the music is. It shows that it's sharing revenue. So you can see the sharing revenue, which is something you can only do with music. You can only monetization share with music. This is not an option if, if somebody just clips down my commentary and puts it on another video. I can either take it down, I can respond to the channel, or I can say I don't care and leave it up. Those are the only options with a video. So music has that different quirk, and then it shows it's being claimed by CD Baby on behalf of uh, Colleen Ballinger. 
So with that, with that, I was surprised when my members only live stream, my members only live stream got a copy claim for revenue sharing. Now the members only live streams don't have ads on them. They're not monetized in that way. Um, because you're already, if you're already a channel member, then you're, you're already a channel member. I'm not putting ads on the members only videos, right? They're just not monetized. Monetization is turned off for, um, members only streams. So when I cross examined slash reacted slash sassed at toxic gossip train on the members only live stream this month, I was very surprised to see that I, in fact, got a copyright claim from inner street recordings on behalf of Colleen Ballinger, a different a different place. Now, the only way this can happen easily and quickly, because this happened pretty quickly, is if somebody owns the rights or says they do and is notified because the broader internet is not going to see it. It doesn't have a million views on it like the H3 video. It's not widely known that I've done this. It's it's known by a much smaller group. So it's not that somebody's doing a manual claim. I think this was done by the copyright system in YouTube. So that YouTube, when they content ID it, they say, hey, there's a content ID. These things match. And then they let the person know who is the supposed rights holder say, hey, this has been matched. Here you go. Well, this was eligible for revenue sharing, which means ad revenue is partly paid to the copyright owner. And monetization, you can see on my video is off. This is from the high video. This is the timestamp that they um, indicated. And then you can see that it's from inner street recordings. So as I started researching inner street recordings, I found that inner street recordings, this, when you try to find inner street recordings, first of all, um, <laughs> Let's just uh, let's just take a look at this website real quick. When I went to reach out to Inner Street Recording, because did I reach out to Colleen Ballinger's lawyers? Yes. Did they respond? Yes. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Did I also reach out or try to reach out to Inner Street Recordings? Yes. This is their website. This is it. I don't even think they have terms of service on this website. Terms of use on the website. They don't tell you. You can file a dispute with YouTube. That's it. And then they talk about being a division of DistroKid. So then I had to go to DistroKid, right? And be like, okay, what is DistroKid? Um, and I reached out to them multiple times. DistroKid seems to be a large music distribution clearinghouse for anyone who wants to upload music and claim it. From everyone that I've talked to, the protections DistroKid has to prove that you own the music is literally like a tick box. Like tick, I own it. So when I reached out to Ballinger's lawyer, Ballinger's lawyer, here, let me pull up the email. Emily, things you should have done before stream. I know, I went out for a walk. So when I reached out to Ballinger's lawyer, I got a very quick response, um, which I appreciate uh, very much. Where did I put this? Sorry, let me pull up. Let me just pull it up so I can read it um, directly. Because again, they responded so quickly. And I really, I really did appreciate that because, you know, lawyers have lives. Well, no, that's not true. In the middle of something like this, <laughs> they might, they might not be, um, they might not be be spending a lot of their time doing anything other than um anything other than dealing with this. So when I reached out to her attorney, where did my, I have too many emails that I can't find this email right now. But when I reached out to her attorney, her attorney told me very clearly that these are not being claimed, that they have no association with that company whatsoever, like none, zero, 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 none, um, that nobody has claimed this at all that Colleen has not uploaded um, this video anywhere. Oh, here we go. Um, Dear Ms. Baker, thank you for your inquiry. Neither our law, for, our law firm nor anyone else um, submitted acting on behalf 
of Miss Ballinger submitted copyright infringement claims in connection with the video or song referenced in your email, which is Toxic Gossip Train. Ballinger is not affiliated with Interstreet Recordings, nor are we familiar with that purported entity. Please provide us with a copy of the DMCA notice, which was YouTube's own copy claim um, that you received, so we may investigate the matter further. So it is clear, and this is a statement they've provided to multiple outlets, so it is clear. Ms. Ballinger did not upload the song to CD Baby, Apple Music, or any other streaming platform for sale or for any other purpose. Ballinger has not monetized the song in any way. We do not we don't know who published it to these streaming platforms. It was done without Ms. Bollinger's knowledge and authorization. We took measures to have the content removed promptly. Well, they might have gotten it removed from CD Baby, but then somebody put it on DistroKid. So at this point, and I have reached out to DistroKid and to DistroKid Legal for comment. After I reached out to DistroKid and DistroKid Legal for comment, the claim on my video was removed. I did not dispute the claim. I was waiting to see what was going to happen, but I did not dispute the claim yet because I wanted to see how this process worked and if it was really that easy to game. The answer that I have come to is yes, it is that easy to game. That anyone on the internet could have taken Toxic Gossip Train and uploaded it and said they own the rights. And it seems that DistroKid would do nothing about it at all. And it seems that YouTube won't take action against large clearinghouses like DistroKid because they work with so much legitimate music. The issue seems to be solely with DistroKid allowing these things to happen. Um, Laura said it was on her official Apple Music. I don't know how that happened. Her lawyers are saying they didn't do it. And I don't know if her lawyers are going to actually take action about it against someone for allowing this to happen because if someone hacked it to make her look bad i mean can you make her look worse at this point i guess so some people if they think that she's the one who uploaded this are going to have a further negative opinion of her um, because it's wild but it is possible that this is all gamed um and that possibility means I can't tell um, if she actually did this or not. Do I think her lawyer is lying? No. Is it possible that she's lying to her lawyer? I mean, that's always possible. Um, that's always possible. But, all right, give me one second. There's a story that I wanted to go over real quickly um let's see that of course i didn't pull up because as i started talking about this i was like hmm. this is possible so people could be trolling her could she be lying sure are her lawyers sending cease and desist to the h3 channel to not talk about the fact that she uploaded it yes they are but we talked about this in the bungee case right in the bungee case someone who was super pissed at the company because the company had copyright claimed their videos about um destiny got pissed made an email address that seemed to mirror the email addresses that destiny or that bungie was legitimately using for copy claims and then went ahead and started copy striking all the big creators in the destiny community prompting all the creators to go to twitter immediately and say what what the fuck, bungie causing Bungie's reputation amongst the community that loves their games to be sullied. And then they had to sue a John Doe and go after YouTube and say, hey, you have to tell us who's doing this in your system. And YouTube is like, please hold. So they had to file a, a lawsuit to do it. So is it a coincidence that she made this a song and a song is the only way you can rev share? I don't know. I don't know her. I don't know her content. I don't know if this was a giant fuck you. I don't know if this was to make copy claims more um, more possible, but you can copy claim a video too, right? And, and she's been on YouTube long enough to know how this is gonna work. So I don't know the answer here, but has the system been gamed with Bungie? Yes. And has the system been gamed by others? Yes. YouTube scammer who stole millions in song royalties sentenced to five years. This happened last month. 
YouTube scammer aggressively defended fake rights to 50,000 songs over five years. A YouTube scammer conspiring to run what Billboard described as possibly the largest music royalty scam in history, um, Jose Tarrin, was recently sentenced by the U.S. government to 70 months in prison. He was hit with a significant sentence U.S. attorney for the District of Arizona wrote in the sentencing memo because of the greed and the great lengths the scam went over the course of five years to fraudulently claim rights to 50,000 songs. Ultimately, the scam routed 20 three million dollars in royalty proceeds away from mostly latin artists and into the bank accounts of the scammer and their co-conspirators the sentencing memo said that he obtained more than six million in personal profits and continued pocketing one hundred and ninety thousand dollars in stolen royalties which he hid from officials even after he was indicted partly because of this he's considered high risk to reoffend. a hefty sentence the attorney said was necessary not only to deter him from launching future scams as he plans to remain in the music business and could potentially regain access to further manipulate YouTube's system monitoring royalties. It is also critical to deter people from launching similar scams because they might believe any potential punishment is worth the payout. The feds literally went, you need to know the juice is not worth the squeeze. The prosecutor noted that the YouTuber's sentence is on the low end of the recommended sentencing guidelines, but it's appropriate to address the government's concern that his sentence reflects the seriousness of the offense and deters future con uh, conduct. The U.S. government requested a restitution hearing to determine how much should be repaid to victims. A pre-sentencing uh, pre report set a restitution amount of $1.4 million, but the government is attempting to connect with victims because many of the victims reside outside the U.S. The government is attempting to broaden its public outreach and translate its notifications into Spanish to gather more information. So not only, not only did they scam copyright, but they scammed copyright in a way that would make it harder for the prosecutors in the U.S., Quote, a future restitution hearing would afford sufficient time for additional victims involved in the case to come forward. Ours could not immediately reach YouTube, lawyer, uh, YouTube or lawyers or the attorneys for the U.S. government for comment. So YouTube maintains a system that is based on, hey, you have to own the rights, but YouTube does not litigate who owns the rights. It's meant to be done by the clearinghouse companies. But if the clearinghouse companies don't get punished, if they don't really manage who owns the rights, then we end up in situations where this can happen. It is a system that we've seen in the bungee lawsuit that is ripe for abuse. What I want to see from YouTube, and I let them know this, to everyone who would listen over the last week, what I want to see from YouTube is that when it is proven to YouTube that these companies have allowed the system to be gamed, that the companies lose their access to the music system. I can't just go do it. I can't just go into the, the music end of YouTube and deal with copy claims. You generally have to go through a music clearinghouse. But if the clearinghouses are not verifying that people own the copyright, then the clearinghouses should be the ones held responsible. And the clearinghouses should be held responsible by losing access at YouTube. YouTube should say, if you manipulate, if you allow people to use your platform to manipulate our system, then you do not get to use our platform. Just like if an independent YouTuber violates their community guidelines, they yeet their channel. Why is YouTube not punishing those who abuse the copyright system, the copy claim system, and the rev sharing system? And they should do so, and they should do so loudly especially if these third-party companies, because at the end of the day, it's not DistroKid did this, it's YouTube creator did this. It drags YouTube through the mud at the end of the day too, because it's always YouTube creator. Anytime someone on the platform does something, it is always YouTube creator, you know, put put autopsy images behind a fucking paywall. YouTube creator sentenced to five years. YouTube creator accused of messaging minors. YouTube's name is always in the headlines of these stories. So YouTube as a platform has a legitimate interest 
in shutting this down. And I realize that Google is a large company, but at the end of the day, you have to protect your platform for the other creators on it like me. Am I self-interested in this? Yes. Yes, I am self-interested in this. When the, when the platform's name gets dragged through the mud by what some creators on the platform do, it damages everyone on the platform or can. So I would like to see YouTube take stronger action. And I, to I told YouTube, um, those that would listen, and I told, well, in my strongly worded email to the DistroKid legal team, I told them what I thought about them allowing their platform to be manipulated. Um, and I also told Colleen's lawyers who probably have bigger things to worry about than going after this system on YouTube, right? Why would Colleen want to spend the money to make this fix? Bungie might though, and Bungie should. Bungie's lawyers have done a great job pointing out the flaws in this system. And there are flaws in the system. The system has to exist, but there are flaws in the system that can be fixed. Punish the bad actors that abuse this system and forward them. And so I absolutely let YouTube know, look, this, this came through DistroKid, I know they're a large distributor on the platform, but if they're letting it, if they're letting their end be fraudulent by just having a tick box and they're not doing anything about it, then maybe you need to consider whether you continue to work with them. It's in your terms of use, just enforce them. That's it, enforce it. So that's, that's what's going on with the copyright. Do I still have questions? Yes. Are we at the bottom of this? No. Can the rev sharing copyright system be gamed? Yes. So can I definitively say how this happened? No. Can, can somebody go to DistroKid, upload this music, claim the rights to it, and then start automatically claiming videos? It seems that that's possible. It seems that that's absolutely possible. So I have a lot more questions. I'm not done digging. I am now, uh, I am now uh, very invested. <laughs> Maybe more than I should be. Maybe more than I should be. Um, I covered the Omni in a Hellcat system. The Omni in a Hellcat system or the Omni in a Hellcat scam is a bit different because it was distributing movies. So it's a little bit different than this um, because it wasn't being played out on, on YouTube. Though he showed the, the um, he showed all of the trappings of his scam on YouTube. He was not perpetrating it through YouTube. I mean, I guess he was kind of using YouTube for sales, but it, the platform wasn't being manipulated for that copyright case. But I cover, I've covered uh, the Omni and Hellcat case a couple times. It's a different, it's a different end of copyright with selling movies and stuff. So yes, for those in the chat that are like, Emily, you're in full lawyer mode. Yes. <laughs> I am. Yeah. Am I a dog with a bone? Yes. I want answers. Why is this so easy to, why is this so easy to game? Why is this system so ripe for abuse? Why was a, why was a creator able to claim 50,000 songs to the tune of $23 million and end up in prison. And the system seems to not have been overhauled. I'm happy to have all these conversations, but the lawyer side of me is like, this is a problem. And if, if I was Colleen Ballinger's lawyer, I would also be super frustrated because at the end of the day, people can use um, intense public scrutiny to game the system. And there's plenty to criticize with regard to Colleen Ballinger's behavior. But this thing might not be the thing to criticize because this thing might truly be somebody gaming the situation. And that is, I mean, I guess not surprising with how the system works. Because the system is open for that. Because YouTube's like, we have to allow these claims to happen. That is the law. But the clearinghouse companies are like, oh, you say you want it? We're good. What? We're just like out here trusting people? Make people prove that it's theirs with a little more than a checkbox. Because the company's not going to prosecute people. It's going to be like, oops, my bad. Um, so sometime overnight, my copy claim, poof, disappeared. 
just magically disappeared. Their legal team hasn't responded yet. I'm interested if they will. But uh, poof. <laughs> the copy claim is gone. And I don't know if the copy claim is gone because it was a fraudulent copy claim. I don't know if the copy claim is gone because um, they removed it. But it's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. And then you have other creators from Elisa or Alyssa. I apologize if I pronounced it wrong at either of those times. And then you have other creators, uh, Ludwig and Jay Schlatt, who made their own versions of classical music specifically for creators to use on their channels instead of getting copyright claimed. But somebody could upload that if they haven't already and go copy claim it. It's wild. All right. So I don't know. I don't know what happened, but I would like it to not happen. And I would like to see YouTube at some point take action against the bad actors that seek to abuse the copyright system on the channel. And I'm not talking about mistakes. I'm talking about habitual bad actors. And if these companies cannot actually monitor who owns music, then YouTube, I believe, can't allow them to claim things on their platform. So that's my opinion on that. We need to talk about a little bit about what happened in the Michael Turley case. We are not getting into um, the facts of that case. I have not been following it. I know it was undergoing trial. We're gonna talk about that real quick. Um, and this reporting, I am it, the reporting that I am relying on is coming from Court TV. I love, witness said, they poke the wrong necks. Emily is riled. <laughs> Look, man, it's nice to focus on something other than murder for a minute. If I can just get to the bottom of how, how platforms are getting gamed and how somebody earned $23 million and ended up in prison over it, I am fascinated. Remember, white collar crime was my favorite thing to do. So this is, this like actually just tickles me. I'm like, I want to know everything. I want all of the documents. So I want to know. So yes, I am riled. I am riled. Um, so let's see. Um, talking about the Michael Turley case, my reporting is coming from, uh, or the reporting that I am relying on is coming from Court TV. This is coming out of uh, Phoenix, Arizona, that Michael Turley, the stepfather of Elisa Turley and the main suspect in her 2001 disappearance has been acquitted of murder charges related to her presumed death. A judge threw out the case and ruled for a motion and ruled for a motion of acquittal in court Monday morning. Oh, let me pull up the article. Hold on. Um, and ordered he be immediately released from custody. He had been in custody, I think, for almost two years pending this case. The defense asked earlier in the day Monday for the judge to issue an acquittal based on what they call a lack of evidence that Michael killed Alyssa, claiming that there was sufficient evidence that she ran away. The news appeared to come as a complete shock to her family who was in court at the time of the ruling. 17-year-old Alyssa went missing at the end of the school year at Paradise Valley High School in 2001. She was first reported as a runaway by Michael who told authorities that she had left a note saying she was going to California. In 2008, new information was brought to light and officials began a criminal investigation into her disappearance. Officials conducted hundreds of interviews with coworkers, family, and friends. When a search warrant was issued at Michael's home, they discovered a bombing plot, at which point he was brought into custody. Officials say he took a plea deal and served 10 years in prison in the bombing plot unrelated to the disappearance. Hmm. Um, he was arrested in 2020 by police in Mesa on second degree murder charges in connection to Alyssa's presumed death. Her body has never been recovered. Mind you, you can prosecute cases even if that is the fact, if, even if that is the case. Sarah, Alyssa's sister, testified in court last week as a key witness. She spent years searching for answers, sharing um, haunting home videos and social media, and even starting a podcast called Voices for Justice. She spoke in court about a troubled relationship between Michael and Alyssa. Alyssa's biological father, who was also in court during the trial, told Scripps News Phoenix that he believes Michael is guilty. What does that mean? What that means is that they did the prosecution's case of the trial. And at the end of the prosecution's case, and you will see this in almost every case, you will see a motion for acquittal or a motion for um, judgment 
not judgment now standing a verdict at the end but a motion for acquittal motion for dismissal um you will they're called different things in different jurisdictions but you will essentially see that motion at the end of the prosecution's case we saw it argued in Depp v heard we saw it argued in Murdoch. we didn't see it argued in um oh gosh there are too many cases the pro per brooks because he was pro per he didn't know so he didn't argue it but every other case we've seen there's always a motion um for acquittal depending on what it's called in different jurisdictions so what that means is that the judge has to determine that there is no evidence that a jury could reasonably rely on to determine that there could be a conviction so when the evidence the court rules that the evidence is too tenuous for a jury to actually find anything other than not guilty they just stop the case there and that's incredibly rare because once a case has gotten past preliminary hearing you generally that evidence will sustain you through a motion for acquittal it did not in this case and i don't why the evidence wasn't sufficient in this case we still don't i don't know i did not watch the trial um i know that last night runkel broke down the oral arguments on this case when the judge made this ruling it is not an easy ruling for a judge to make most judges want this to go to a jury but so it is an incredibly rare and and unusual ruling that once you get through an entire prosecution's case the judge is like there is just not enough evidence here to find guilt and that is what um that is what the court ruled in this case so i again i have not followed the um i have not followed the ins and outs of the evidence in this case but it sounds like again there was going to be difficulty finding that she had been killed um and again you can do cases when you've never recovered a body that happens it is more difficult because you can't prove how somebody died or where they died so it is more difficult to prove that then this person in court is the person that did it but it can happen and it does happen so he has now been acquitted and released from jail what happens now nothing he's acquitted and released from jail because jeopardy attached when the jury was selected jeopardy is attached and he cannot be put in jeopardy again for this crime the prosecution can't appeal there is nothing that can happen it is done so it raises questions about how this got past a preliminary hearing for me and again it's not a case i followed this has to be tremendously frustrating for the victim's family um, and loved ones and i can imagine the absolute um absolute frustration that this never got to a jury um vanessa says in the chat even if he later admits to it he cannot be tried in criminal court again for this murder jeopardy has attached could there be a civil wrongful death suit if he later admits it yes but there cannot be another criminal case relating to this jeopardy has attached and that prosecutors um prosecutors have to make these decisions before they get to a jury i don't know what decisions they brought uh, or what decisions they made pam d said even if they find her body new evidence new evidence doesn't matter um he can't be tried again for this murder jeopardy is attached he has been acquitted so it whatever happens from here this cannot go to criminal trial again he has been tried and the court found that there was not enough evidence for this to go forward so there is nothing else that can happen in the criminal case could there be a civil wrongful death perhaps i don't know the i don't know the ins and outs of the facts of this case to tell you whether that's a good idea or a bad idea or or what 
I don't know the facts of this case. I got asked a ton yesterday about what would happen or what this means. And so in a very broad and general way, this is what a motion for acquittal means. Um, I saw another question about a lesser crime. No, they can't bring a lesser crime. It's the same. So no, they can't bring a manslaughter. A manslaughter is still putting him in jeopardy again for the death of this individual. So it would be, I don't see any criminal that could be brought um, on this, but I, again, don't know enough of the facts. So he cannot be tried again for this murder, even if it's tried in a different way. This was a trial for a second degree murder. Um, so no, they can't bring in some type of manslaughter at all. So the, uh, the exact language of the rule the court used, and this is coming from um, Arizona 5, looks like a CBS outlet, Phoenix 3 TV, CBS 5. The exact language is, there is no substantial evidence to warrant a conviction. And that is what it is. Terry said, can they appeal? No, they can't appeal. No, they can't appeal. Why can't they appeal? Because Jeopardy is already attached. He has been tried. The court acquitted him. Um, Laura M., what if the court called it wrong? Then he's acquitted. If the court decided wrong, then he's acquitted. This cannot, this judge's ruling cannot be appealed. Um, so can he be tried for obstruction of justice if he hid evidence? There, it would have to go a long way to find that there was, there was hidden evidence, but I don't know the facts well enough to tell you. Someone asked about federal or another jurisdiction, not for murder. Um... Can he get new criminal charges in relation to this at all? Not in relation to him being the person who took a life. No. Um, if if there is an obstruction of justice, I don't, again, this is very hypothetical because I don't know the facts. If there are facts that he impeded an investigation, could there be ancillary charges? They can't be the same charges, though. This can't be... Um, it can't be related to the death. Could it be related to the investigation? That's slightly different. Would they do that? I don't know. Could he be tried for obstruction? I don't know if there's facts there um, for that. Why did the judge render a verdict? He could have dismissed without prejudice. If new evidence comes up, they can try again because that is apparently not what the facts entailed for this judge. This judge found there is no substantial evidence to warrant a conviction. So they're not gonna just let it try again the prosecution brought this to trial jeopardy has attached so no so it's a lack of positive evidence this goes directly to innocent until proven guilty yes this goes to innocent until proven guilty and the state did not pass the threshold to allow a jury to determine guilt or not um could they try him in another state no jeopardy has attached they can't try him in another state um so no the family must be devastated. I agree. I absolutely agree that the family must be devastated. But this is, again, part of the prosecutors knowing um, knowing their evidence. I will be interested to see what the prosecution has to say about this, but there's nothing that they can do. They can't appeal it. It can't go to the Supreme Court. There is, this is the literally the end of a criminal prosecution for homicide, as uncomfortable as that feels. However, can we take it out of this circumstance and think of a circumstance where someone is um, unfavored be in a particular locality because of their, I don't know, gender, race, religion, uh, political viewpoint, sexual orientation, and they are unfavored because of that. And the justice system could just keep throwing things at them to keep them in jail. And there was no jeopardy. It would allow for persecution potentially in a really, really strange way. And that's why our constitution does not allow you to keep, keep going after things. 
if a jury hangs and a jury can't agree, you can prosecute again. But you can't just keep going, okay, well, what about this? And what about that? And let's try it this way. You cannot twice be put in jeopardy for the same crime. And we've seen results where, like in the O.J. Simpson case, we've seen results in the O.J. Simpson case where um, he was acquitted in the homicide and then found liable in the wrongful death because those are a different standard. And that might happen. J. Deborah said Flowers was tried 11 times, which can happen if a jury can't come to a decision. Question, can the judge's decision be appealed? No, it cannot be. Um, so again, I don't know. Question, why is Jeopardy attached? They started the trial. So Jeopardy attaches when you start swearing in a jury. Um, which means that if you start swearing in a jury and something happens like a mistrial, you have to declare the mistrial so the case can be retried. But once Jeopardy attaches and there is a final result, you cannot retry it. The defense can appeal, right? Because you're taking liberty from the defendant. The defendant can appeal if they are convicted. But if they are acquitted, it is done. There is nothing else. There can be civil liability, but there is nothing else in the criminal realm. Um... So that's why Jeopardy, Jeopardy attached. I understand protections against prosecution. The prosecution chose to go to trial. So um, Ian said that in Canada, there's no Jeopardy, double Jeopardy. The Crown can keep trying to appeal. And that would be an odd result, too, if you're acquitted and a judge finds there's no evidence and they really, really want to get after you. That is a problem. So... Um, I'm interested to see what the prosecutions will say after this. Um, or, and, and I'm, I'm interested in what the evidence is. I will look into it more. I have not followed this case because I would like to be able to give you guys more answers, um, in the specifics, but we would have to go through the hearing. And if that's something you guys want to do, we will, um, we can go through the arguments in the hearing that was done. Runkle did it yesterday on his stream too. So. Uh, let's see. Can they release evidence now that wasn't allowed in trial? If there was evidence, if there was evidence kept out um, for legal purposes, can they release it to the public? I don't know if they will. So I don't know if they will. Um, so they have to find something else to get him to jail. Only if he did something else. Um, if there if there are other charges there they should have brought them at the time um for all of you asking in the chat what case are we talking about we are talking about the michael turley case out of arizona the judge ruled yesterday um on a motion for acquittal and acquitted the defendant after the prosecution's case in chief rested at trial and then the jury was dismissed so um we are going to move on and i will get to more questions from this question if sarah continues talking about him on her podcast can she be sued for defamation that is so it's a good question that disney nerd but it's very fact specific so it depends on what is is um it depends on what is said it's turny not turly oh sorry i i apologize i did read that as turly it is turny my brain my brain in inputted an l and i apologize it reminds me of the movie Double Jeopardy. That's exactly the movie. If anybody has questions about Double Jeopardy, it's actually a pretty good movie about the rules of Double Jeopardy. Um, so it is it is interesting. Um, does the same judge usually do the preliminary hearing and trial? It depends on the jurisdiction and not always. And I don't know if that's the case here. If he is convicted of another murder, could they revisit this case? No. This case, this case cannot be revisited by this for this individual and this victim that has been tried and that is done so no i think there is a there is a reason that double jeopardy exists it's to you know when you look at the u.s justice system and the time in which it was written into law you have to look at the way that people could be prosecuted based on the word of someone who was anonymous 
And so when you start looking historically at why some of the things exist that exist, a lot of our system was, okay, we don't want that to happen and we don't want this to happen and we don't want that to happen. And how do we do that? And that's where you get the right to confront your accuser, to see the person who's saying that you did the thing instead of them being able to do it anonymously or behind closed doors. We see that you have the right against, you know, the right to double jeopardy, where if you are put in jeopardy, meaning your your liberty is at jeopardy, or sometimes your life is at jeopardy, where you've been tried for a thing and you are acquitted, you they can't just keep doing it. Because then there is the power of the government and the, the worry that they will um, or could just persecute people because they want to put them in jail without anything, right? So the reason we um, we have these rules is that we don't want the government just being able to lock people up into prison. We could have a much different and much longer conversation about how many people are in prison in the United States given all the protections that we have, and that is a entirely different conversation that is consistently being had and consistently needs to be had but we want to disincentivize the government to be able to just keep going after people. And sometimes those results in law don't feel like the right result. And I've seen a lot of that on the internet that the result in law does not feel like the right result here. Our law is supposed to, when it works the way it should, our law is supposed to default to it is better to let the guilty go free than to have the innocent be jailed. That is the way our system is supposed to default. That is supposed to, we are supposed to err on the side, not of locking up the innocent, but of releasing the guilty. That is the way that the system is supposed to work in its, in its idealized form. So with all of that, um, that is what it is. Peggy said, the judge said he was acquitted on this charge only. Does that statement happen often? This does not happen often. This does not happen often at all. This is a very unusual and rare result. But the judge wants to make it clear that the judge, because he has been in prison on other things, it sounds like he does have other convictions. The judge is not immuting those other convictions. The judge is just dealing with this. So, um, Gina asked a great question, and I think these are worthy questions to have. I know we're in the quick bits, but there's a lot of conversation about Jeopardy. Is double Jeopardy for murder cases only? No. Jeopardy attaches in all criminal cases. Um, and there's a lot of conversations about when in a proceeding Jeopardy attaches, and that's a whole different law school lecture to have that conversation about when Jeopardy attaches and when you are really in Jeopardy or not in Jeopardy. But... It attaches in all cases. The thing is, if you're dealing with cases of crimes of more frequency, things like, um, sadly, DUI is a crime that can be a crime of frequency, petty theft, um, drug possession, drug dealing, things like that, it would have to be that specific incident, right? So you couldn't be tried again for this one incident, but if there's another incident on a different day that is the same charge but is a completely different circumstance, you can be tried again for that. Um... Let's see. Somebody said, did I hear you right that you said letting the guilty, um, letting the guilty go free? Where is the, I, I missed the comment. The, the system air is innocent until proven guilty. So you have people that cannot be proven guilty that are in fact a guilty, that cannot be proven guilty, that, that are not prosecuted. Yes, that is, that is the default. You don't want to convict the innocent. That is abhorrent it happens it shouldn't it happens it shouldn't um and the system is set up so that it doesn't so that's where we are and i think people are very very frustrated with it um so hopefully that helps explain that this can happen that there is no appeal what jeopardy means what double jeopardy means um Seesaw says, question, if her body is found in another state, couldn't the other state or jurisdiction indict? No. It's the same circumstance. It's the same, it's the same, um, it's the same set of facts. 
So that's why I wanted to talk about it um, because this is a very rare circumstance and a very unique circumstance. I will look at the case more and I, if you guys are interested, it sounds like you are. I will look at the case more and look at the facts of the case more and see if I can provide more answers about why this happened, but I'm going to have to dive into it more, but I wanted to at least answer some questions on it because this is something where I know a lot of those who have followed this case, there is a legality morality conflict here, right? Where this is the, the result under the law, but it doesn't feel like the right result. And that's a really uncomfortable feeling, a really uncomfortable feeling. Um, so the Rachel K said fascinating since this really happens. It does. It's got to be, um, it's got to be heartbreaking for the victim's family. Debbie says, is an acquittal sort of a black mark on the prosecution? I don't think so. What I'm, what I'm most concerned about is if the prosecution had the conversations with the family that this is a difficult case, if the family was prepared for the fact that this is a hard case to put in front of a jury, I'm more worried about that. Acquittals happen. Um, Emily, do you only have one earring in? No, the other one's just hidden behind my hair. I saw Adam McIntyre in the chat. Hi, Adam. What about federal versus state courts? Kit, you're asking the hard questions here in the chat about double jeopardy. It makes me feel like I'm teaching law school. Welcome. Um, there are very rare circumstances where you could be tried for something similar in federal court and state court. They are generally around weapon charges, but for homicide cases, the elements are the same. So the elements are generally the same across um across federal homicide statutes and state homicide statutes so no they're the same it's the same you would be trying somebody for the same crime again so different jurisdiction doesn't matter if he admits it later it does not matter it would matter for a civil wrongful death lawsuit if he or if someone confessed to a kidnapping could they perhaps be tried for the kidnapping and not the murder maybe if they confess to other things um, could they be tried for that and not the murder? Yes, maybe. It would be difficult because you would have to tell the jury that you're not trying them for the murder. You're just dealing with this certain thing. Is that possible? In theory, yes. In theory, yes. Um, it is possible. So let's see. Good to see you, Adam. Good to see you. We've been, the law nerds have been sending you all of all of the support. We talked about copyright a little bit earlier with the toxic gossip train wreck um question if she is found alive and he then kills her could he be tried again that is a bitty i uh, bibby i understand the question it is kind of a a dark question but he's been acquitted so no because he's been acquitted but if he was convicted of murder and then found alive that would be a much different result um a much different result but no he is acquitted and that's basically that's basically the movie double jeopardy that the chat's talking about there is a movie about this double jeopardy um and that's basically the scenario in the movie double jeopardy so uh yes no we don't want to incur isn't that the same as the movie plot that is basically the movie plot so there um there are a lot of what ifs on this but here is what here is what the judge has done. In ruling that there is not enough evidence to warrant a conviction, the judge has ended the prosecution for this homicide. So any pro, any future prosecution about the killing of this victim at, by this individual, Michael Turney, cannot happen. The judge's ruling cannot be appealed. This is the end of this criminal case. Could there be civil cases? Perhaps. Could they be difficult? Perhaps. So, um, somebody said in the chat, my husband just walked by and asked, why is Emily's hair not purple? Because it's summer. Um, it's, it's a little purple, but it's faded and I have not re-dyed it because I've been in waters and pools and things like that. That is why. Um, is that really an old movie though? It's not an old movie. Did I say it was an old movie? I hope I didn't. When did Double Jeopardy come out? It's a really good movie. Um, Double Jeopardy movie. When did this come out? It is a good movie. 1999. 
I guess that's um, old is is up for old is up for debate. Um, so that is an Ashley Judd movie. It's a good movie. So <laughs> somebody said oh, the movie's older than half the chat. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> depends it was made in the 90s does that mean it's old i was made in the 70s that definitely makes me old then um anyway so it's a good movie it's yeah it's a good movie so i would play the trailer but then i will absolutely not be able to continue to show you this video because it will get shut down um all right um, lasting memory says double jeopardy doesn't exist with the military tim henning's murder uh 2014 case Military law is a whole separate and specific thing to civilian law. It is a whole, whole different scenario. All right, we need to move on. If you guys have more questions, we'll answer them during Q&A because we do have like an hour long court hearing we need to get to. But if you are curious about hypothetical scenarios that um, hypothetical scenarios regarding double jeopardy, I recommend the movie. I'm sure it's on streaming services. Sheila just said something in the chat that I find stunning. Adam McIntyre said in a video, he thought you were in your 30s. I'm here for it. I'll take it. Don't tell, don't tell Adam that I'm old AF. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Um, I think I was talking about me not, I'm definitely not in my 30s. They were delightful though. I enjoyed them. Um, but I have a 15 year old. I've been a lawyer for 17 years. Sometimes the math just doesn't math. So if you're interested, go see that. So the boundaries, the boundaries for double jeopardy, this crime. So homicide is generally the killing of another person, that crime. So that crime, things within that bucket, crimes related to the killing of another person, that person being this victim by this defendant. So Alyssa being the victim, Michael being the defendant. That cannot be retried, that particular bucket. If there are other buckets of other activity that are different crimes that are not the killing of a person, then that is possible should there be sufficient evidence. Hopefully that helps explain double jeopardy. This is a tremendously rare situation where a case gets past a preliminary hearing. I need to go look and see if it was indicted, um, where a case gets past a preliminary hearing and then gets to trial and then at trial the judge is like there's just not enough evidence to give this to a jury very very unusual okay speaking of unusual things let's let's move on to murdaw should we don't google it don't google murdaw don't go don't google murdaw's custody photos i'm i'm telling you right now there are things you don't want in your life and that is something that you cannot unsee and don't want in your life and if you choose to do that, buyer beware. Like caveat emptor, you have done that to yourself. <laughs> if somebody tags you and is like, you've got to see this, it's murder. Don't, don't. What you don't need is a shirt loss, shirt loss, shirtless murder in your life. What I don't need is a shirtless murder in my life. I was not ready. It was like, ah! Sometimes Twitter's dangerous. Let's talk about murder. There's a couple things going on in the Murdoch cases right now. Tomorrow's podcast is about Girardi. Girardi currently has more underlying cases than Murdoch does, but that might change. Murdoch is still pending a whole bunch of criminal cases. There are a lot of motions that have been going on in the Mallory Beach case. Mallory Beach was killed in the boat crash where it was alleged that Paul Murdoch was driving before those criminal before that criminal case ever went to preliminary hearing or trial, Paul Murdaugh was murdered. Alec Murdaugh was convicted for that murder. There are still obstruction of justice cases going on with Alec Murdaugh's uh, behavior with regard to the boat crash case and what happened after the boat crash case. The boat crash case is absolutely heartbreaking, um, but it, it is just now coming to settlement. So there is a hearing going on with Mark Tinsley. Mark Tinsley represents the Beach family. We saw him in the Murdaugh trial. 
And there are things going on between Parker's, which is where alcohol was purchased by minors. Uh, Paul purchased alcohol using his brother Buster's identification. So there is a civil case going on against Parker's that is the case we are going to be talk about, talking about. There is a separate civil case going on against the owners of Parker's per- specifically. The estate of Maggie Murdaugh and the estate of Paul Murdaugh have settled their cases. Alec Murdaugh's lawyers have told uh, the media that they will be settling their part of the Mallory Beach case. So there is Parker's, the um, the like convenience store that sold the liquor or sold the alcohol, um, beer and such. And then there is other cases connected to that. Um, and there's a harassment case going on. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Before we get there, the Mallory Beach case um, also has some of the litigation regarding attorney's fees for Alec Murdoch. This is separate than the Satterfield case where Alec Murdoch is trying to withdraw his confession of judgment. So with regard to the attorney's fees, Alec Murdaugh asked if he could get back some of the money from his like 401k to pay his attorneys for trial. I covered this a while back. He needed additional like hundreds of thousands of dollars or whatever to pay Jim and Poot. And that was pending last month. So we're going to pull up the judge's order on that and see what happened with the attorney's fees. You might remember that it was like, but we paid, we didn't get our lawyer's fees and we paid all these experts and we need this additional money to appeal the criminal conviction. And the receivership that is put in place was like, you knew how much money you had, budget accordingly. Because the money that was in the uh, the 401k for Alec Murdaugh, part of it was going into receivership for settlements with victims. Some of it went to attorney's fees already. Does that all make sense? Hopefully that all makes sense. So right now we're going to take a look at the judge's ruling from, when is this from? June 9th. It's been a minute since we've talked about Murdaugh because everybody else has been uh, litigating. So. Let's see. Um, This is in the Beach case decision by the court. This is literally like a checkbox decision. This is the decision statement of judgment. After careful consideration, defendant Richard Alexander Murdaugh's motion for reconsideration of order denying application for payment of attorney's fees from untainted funds is denied. The parties have provided an ample record on which the court relies to deny the motion for reconsideration. So the court had said, you can't use the the rest of this money for attorney's fees. And then Murdaugh went, please, please think again. And the court went, I thought about it. No, you cannot use this money from this receivership for attorney's fees for your appeal. Do you remember the motion where Murdaugh's attorneys were like, but we need to, we need the money. We need to appeal it. Otherwise it's going to end up on the desk of the public defender's office and they are not well funded and or do you remember all of this yes so the court is just like leave you're not getting your attorney's fees go lara uh said in the chat when your mom tells you to ask again in five minutes but the answer won't change yes they asked the judge to reconsider and the judge was like i've reconsidered my answer stands so now um we have oh no this is the older motion we have an appeal on that motion and the appeal on that motion is literally going up to the appellate court saying no no we need the rest of that money and that we did not cover this is the reconsideration this is the one that was denied i gave you we we gave you the end result but i want to tell you about the money because Aren't we always interested in following the money? At least I am. Are y'all nosy like me? I want to follow the money. I want to know the money. Defendant Murdaugh, by and through undersigned attorney, hereby request an order directing the receivers to transfer $160,000 from the escrow account to pay attorney's fees and costs of appeal for his recent convictions and sentence imposed. This court previously entered an order permitting Murdaugh to liquidate his retirement account with $600,000 of the funds 
to be used for the cost of defending the murders. 600, $600,000 to defend the murder and related charges. The balance of funds from the liquidation of the retirement account is $424,000. On March 3rd, Murdaugh was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences without parole following a six-week trial that began in January. Oh, don't we remember. Murdaugh filed notice of appeal March 9th. I need to go back and check and see if they've filed their actual appeal. I don't think they have yet. The funds received from Murdaugh's retirement account in defense of the murders and related charges at trial have been exhausted. Specifically, the undersigned paid $518,000 in out-of-pocket defense cost and trial counsel received attorney's fees in the amount of $81,000. The undersigned will submit a full accounting of these expenses under seal if requested. So when we talk about costs in tomorrow's podcast, costs, experts, place to say during trial, filing fees, experts, costs, not attorney's fees, costs. $518,000 in costs and attorney's fees in $81,000. The undersigned will submit a full accounting if requested. The attorney's fees by counsel is grossly insufficient to cover the actual attorney's fees incurred preparing for and defending Murdaugh during six weeks. The defense team consisted of four attorneys and two paralegals. It's a lot of people on a defense team. In addition, the attorneys and office support staff working on site supporting the team. So there were four attorneys and two paralegals on the team, plus attorneys and support staff working offsite supporting the team. A conservative estimate of the total attorney's fees incurred during trial alone is $700,000. This does not include compensation for legal services preparing the case for trial. A conservative estimate of 60 hours per week for four attorneys, totaling 240 hours for, per week. 240 hours per week for six weeks amounts to uh, 14,400 hours using the average hourly rate of $500, which is probably low for some of those attorneys, but might be appropriate for the region. The total fees for just the trial attorneys comes to $700,000. So when we say this is like a multi-million dollar defense, it is. But he picked his lawyers. The undersigned request $160,000 to pay for fees and expenses to represent Murdaugh on appeal. And the court has said no again. Murdaugh has the Sixth Amendment right to hire the counsel of his choice from the untainted funds. And the court was like, no, take it up on appeal. Take it up on appeal. Take it up on appeal. I don't want to hear it. So he's appealing it. He is appealing this asking for his funds. You know, tomorrow... Uh, in the podcast, there's a pretty uh, interesting, <laughs> a pretty interesting result on appeal uh, that I think you guys might want to see. There is another motion. Um, it's, what's also funny is this judge is probably like, "Oh, you want to pay somebody? Want to pay me six hundred thousand dollars? Pay me then." The judge is not having any of this, and the judge, the judges are not making nearly this kind of money. There is another motion that I wanted to bring up. It was a motion for protective order that was filed in, I believe, in the Mallory Beach case. I just saw it last night as I was preparing, um, as I was preparing for today, and I'm trying to find it. So give me, give me 30 seconds. Let me see where it is. Um, that's the notice of appeal. Where is my notice of protective order? Is it this one? There it is. All right. This was just filed yesterday. Uh, this is filed in the Mallory Beach case. Remember, the attorneys are fighting most right now in the Satterfield case where Dick and Poot are fighting over, um, no, Dick and Jim. Dick is Poot. Dick and Jim are fighting with Eric Bland in the Satterfield case. But we have seen the attorneys sparring in other cases, and we saw during the Murdoch trial, or at least I believe, in my opinion, that there wasn't a lot of love lost between Jim and Dick and the attorneys in the Mallory Beach case. And that is kind of spilling out a little bit in this motion for protective order that was filed on the 14th, so just a few days ago. So let's talk about that real quick. 
And um, I'll be interested to see if his attorneys keep representing him and not getting paid. Where's the money going to go? And where's the money going to come from? All right. So this is a motion. Richard Alexander Murdoch's. This is Dick Murdoch's motion for a protective order in the Mallory Beach case. Comes now defendant Murdoch and moves for a protective order to restrict the use of the deposition of defendant Murdoch to this proceeding and to preclude the parties from disseminating the deposition, whether in the form of written transcript, video recordings, or any other form of content from the depos deposition to the press or public by any means. What's your immediate first question? What's your immediate first question? What the fuck's in the deposition? What's in the deposition? What is in the deposition? All of you, what did he say? What did he say? What did he say, right? Streisand this shit, what now we wanna know? There's a deposition, what's in it? There's a video deposition? Tell me more, tell me everything. While the public and the media have a right to information about cases, the parties in the judicial system have an interest in preventing out-of-court statements from interfering with the fair adjudication of the case. You're settling this case, though. You're settling this case. Rule 3.6 of the South Carolina Rules of Professional Conduct reflect this concern and prohibits a lawyer who participates in a matter from making an extrajudicial statement, quote, that the lawyer knows or reasonably should know will be publicly disseminated and has a substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing an adjudicative proceeding. The press coverage and public attention to this case. We see this in tomorrow's podcast as well. Everybody yelling about the press. The press coverage and public attention to this case, which has been partly fueled by attorneys involved in this litigation. Are you telling on yourselves? Or are you now just mad at Tinsley? Who are you mad at? Are you mad at all of them? Partly fueled by the attorneys involved in this litigation has been contentious and or continuous and relentless. God, it's not as continuous as the Idaho case at the moment, though. The media will publish anything it can about this case. Well, the media should start publishing what's in that deposition. I'm curious. I'm being facetious and cheeky. But if the case settles, maybe we'll see. The media will publish anything it can about this case, including shirtless Murdaugh, apparently. And the publicity toward Alec Murdaugh has only increased in intensity over time. Has it? I feel like it has dissipated. I feel like it has dissipated since the, um, I feel like it has dissipated since the verdict. Don't you? With the ongoing media frenzy, it is already more than reasonably likely that a jury's ability to give equal attention to all parties in this lawsuit and fairly weigh the evidence presented in the trial will be hindered. We're going to hear about this more in the motion that we're going to watch right after this because that's part of what they're fighting about. Parker's wants to be separated from Murdaugh to say, I can't go to trial sitting next to Murdaugh in this case. And we're going to hear that hearing. It is already more than reasonably likely that the jury's ability to give attention to all parties in this lawsuit and fairly weigh the evidence presented at trial will be hindered. Trial was coming up uh, in uh, later this month on this case. Public dissemination of defendant Murdaugh's deposition materials to the press or public would facilitate further media attention and would have a substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing the trial. Such disclosure... Excuse me, such disclosure would serve no discernible purpose in allowing any party to this action to prepare to prosecute or defend this action. Under these circumstances, justice requires that the parties be prohibited from furnishing defendant Murdaugh's deposition materials to the press or public by any means. A protective order restricting the use of Murdaugh's deposition to this proceeding will mitigate the potential for undue prejudice to defendant Murdaugh. Again, they say they're settling as of yesterday. So they're asking for a protective order. They're throwing shade again at the media who just keeps covering this case. Bah! Keeps covering the case. Keeps covering the case. So with that, we are going to take a look at the hearing before we talk about the settlement. Because part of what they're talking about in that protective order is exactly this. 
hold on, is exactly this. Let me make this uh, full screen on a different screen. It's been a minute since we've watched a proceeding together. Let me try to gain up this volume. This is coming from uh, Court TV's cameras inside the courtroom in the Mallory Beach hearing um, ahead of trial. This case was scheduled to go to trial. This case was on, this hearing was on Friday. So these are motions pending with regard to Parker's and the Beach family. And then after this, they settled and we'll talk about the settlement uh, in a minute. So let me turn the volume up. Let me go ahead and add this uh, to the to the feed. All right. We are going to take a look at the argument on motions in regard to Parker's and the Beach family in the boat crash case. This was ahead of it going to trial before it settled. I think the result of this hearing is that the case did settle because of this hearing. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to cover up. <laughs> I'm going to cover the court clerk here uh, down in the bottom corner, but we should be able to see the attorneys argue pretty well. So this hearing is about 45 minutes long, and we're going to pause it as we need to explain and talk about it. So uh, let's uh, let's go on with that. Uh, Hold on, let me come back. Steel City said the Beach family has a separate civil conspiracy case against Parker for leaking photos. They do. Um, it's civil conspiracy. There's a few other charges, harassment and some other stuff. But yes, against the owner of Parker's separately, not the company, the individual. So that case is still ongoing. This is settled by insurance companies, and we'll talk about that. This is a different courtroom. This is not the exact same courtroom that the trial was in. I, it's the same courthouse, but I don't believe it's the exact same courtroom. We're on the record in chat. Let me know if you can hear 19 CP 25 uh, Renee Beach is personal representative of the estate of Mallory Beach representing uh, uh, Renee Beach in the estate is uh, Mark Tinsley, Tabor Vall and John Nichols. They're present here in the courtroom uh, versus Park, Greg Parker Incorporated. He's represented by Mr. Shearer uh, and uh, Mr. Williford. Uh, any y'all have anybody else here? This does seem a little bit low. And I believe uh, Dolls Cook is the attorney for Richard Alec Santa Murray. Uh, sent word that he would be running a little bit late. He was not opposed to the court uh, proceeding with uh, the hearing this morning uh, as he the attorney for Alec Murdaugh in this case is running late and they said they don't care because Murdaugh's motions are not up. Murdaugh is a co-defendant in this case, but those motions aren't being argued. It's just the Parker motions. He makes his way here. I think the first matter we had uh, that when we talked briefly before we started uh, with the attorneys, Mr. Tinsley, I believe you had a motion or something you need to put in the, on the record in regard to the estate of Paul Murdoch. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, this last week, uh, we filed a motion to dismiss the claims against the estate of Paul Murdoch. As you recall, um, Paul Murdoch wasn't named as a defendant, um, but due to some of the financial concerns and things that were going on in the fall, uh, we filed Liz pendants, and then after the murders, uh, we added the estates uh, in order to identify whether or not the estates were being used to hide assets that belong to Alex Murdoch. Uh, we have investigated that. There are no assets in Paul Murdoch's estate that belong to or are owed to or have been used to hide assets. And based on uh, that discovery, we have asked the court to dismiss the claims against the estate without prejudice. Uh, Paul Murdoch's estate's lawyer, David Overstreet, is here and consents to the motion. And I think now uh, Parker's is finally consent as well. Right. And when I call on you too, if you would uh, tell us your full name, the court reporter doesn't know all the attorneys. Oh, we do. <laughs> yes, your Honor, we do. My name's Mark Tinsley and we, I represent the Beach family. Right. We know Mark Mr. Tinsley. Mr. Street, you're here on behalf of the estate of uh, Paul Murda. I'll be glad Murda, I'll be glad to hear from you. Yes, Your Honor. Back David to the Overstreet, accents. From Earhart Overstreet on behalf of uh, Randy Murda. As PR for the estate of Paul Murdoch, we obviously consent to Mr. Tinsley's motion for a non-suit without prejudice against the estate. 
Right. We're back Mitch to Mitch Shear. Do you wish to be heard? Uh, Whether it's Murdoch. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Murdoch. P.K. Shear Murdoch. From, uh, with the law firm of Huff Powell Bailey. I uh, do not wish to be heard, Your Honor. Uh, we have no objection. All right. Thank you. Then, Mr. Tinsley, if you'll e-file the appropriate order, and then I'll f sign that order uh, when it's in my queue. Thank you, Your Honor. Can you right, just I think the next zoom matter out to all the tables and leave it be? Is there are two motions that are pending in the case brought on behalf of Greg Parker. I have a feeling this is why the chat wanted to cover um, this. Because y'all love you One motion Tinsley. is the defendant, Greg Parker, uh, incorporates motion to sever. And then There's no additionally, jury. We're going to have to wait until we've got Parker a jury. incorporated motion uh, to uh, change venue. So, Mr. Shearer, I'll be glad to hear those in whatever order you deem appropriate. Yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, we would uh, prefer to start with the, <clears throat> excuse me, the motion. Okay. Two motions pending. A motion for change of venue and a motion to separate Parker from Murdoch. And then they're going to let the moving party, which is the attorney for Parker's, address this in whichever way that they like. You see the sound crew in the back of the courtroom. We didn't get to see that that much during trial, but you see the sound crew in the back of the courtroom. I'm glad that this is uh, being covered by Court TV. Motion to sever, with the court's permission. Motion to sever. So that is a motion to, to separate you, Your Honor. Murdoch uh, from Parker's. Good morning, uh, may it please the court. Uh, your Honor, I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time talking about the facts of this case. Obviously, the court uh, and, frankly, uh, the state, everyone, the nation, all, and maybe even the world knows we're, about the facts we're of these where. cases. Um, it's fair. We initially, on behalf of Parker, sought severance uh, from this court uh, back in August of 2022. Your Honor, as you're well aware, that uh, Your Honor granted that motion uh, and issued a very detailed order dated September 13, 2022. Uh, <clears throat> and then ultimately, um, Your Honor, after uh, granting the motion, reversed it two weeks later. Uh, without reading the entire order uh, uh, in its entirety. That's interesting that it had been granted and then was not. So this, again, is Parker's, the, the location that sold alcohol, trying to separate themselves away from Murdoch. And you can understand why the company does not want to be tried at the same time as Murdoch. They don't want the jury to just say, lump them all together and go, right? To this court, um, your honor, you're aware that you decided on page five of the order. Let me, I have a file here in front of me. So if I'm looking down, I don't mean to be showing anybody in di any disrespect. Yes, I'm listening, but I'm reading along with you. As yes, you're sir. Going through it. All right, go uh, ahead. On page five of, of your order, your honor, uh, this was the order granting the uh, original severance. It says in the middle of the paragraph there, and if there was ever a case in which a court may exercise its sound discretion to order separate trials to prevent delays or prejudice, this is it. Notice Based the word Based on the facts prejudice. and circumstances involving the parties in this matter. Um, Your Honor, at that time, uh, you made a decision to to sever Parker's away from multiple Murdoch defendants. At that time, Your Honor, as you're aware, the estate of Paul was there. Uh, Alec Murdoch Maggie, uh, was all, also a named defendant. Buster was a defendant. The estate of Maggie was a defendant at the time as well. Um, and I'm very interested to find out why the judge decided to separate or sever the parties, allow the Murdochs to be tried together allow uh, Parker's to be tried separately, meaning different juries, different trials, let them all be tried separately so you don't have Parker's, the company, sitting there next to now convicted murderer Alec Murdaugh. I can understand why they want to do it. What I'm very curious about, and I'm hoping that he lets us know, is why did the judge change his mind? And then why do they think the judge is going to change his mind back? So at this time, uh, Things, the law and the facts are generally the same, Your Honor, but there are some material things that have changed the dynamics. As Your Honor would remember that at the time that we moved for the, for the first severance, uh, Alec Murdoch was indicted, but he was not convicted of the murders of, uh, of his son Paul and his wife Maggie. Since that time and since the original severance, 
uh, and the reversal. What is different now? Standing here today, we now know that Elliot Murdoch has been convicted of murdering his wife, Maggie, and his son, Paul. Yeah, that's worse. Who, at the time, were co-defendants of Parker's. Who are no longer co-defendants. The media frenzy surrounding Alec Murdoch and his uh, murder conviction has gone beyond... I think Parker settled because of this ruling, which is why we're watching the hearing. When I put it up for a vote yesterday, even though Parker settled on Monday, this happened on Friday, we're going to get to see how one motion hearing can change the course of a case because this case was getting ready for trial so with this case getting ready for trial this motion hearing is hugely consequential and i think it matters because tinsley got up at the trial of alec murdoch and said look this hearing that we were getting ready to do weighed heavily on him and of course the lawyers for murdoch tried to downplay that saying this hearing isn't going to change anything yes one hearing can change things. And this is a hearing that I think changed it um, substantially. So that's part of why we're going through it. Also, everybody just loves Mark Tinsley. So, <laughs> so everybody wants to see him argue these motions. And it's been a while since we've done a live court hearing. So here we are. South Carolina, beyond the Southeast, it's gone national and global. It has gone national. The plaintiff has settled and dismissed everyone else they just recently as the court just heard are now dismissing without prejudice the estate of paul murdoch who was driving the boat that ultimately killed mallory beach on that tragic night and so we sit here now with parkers and Alec murdoch as the remaining code uh, defendants in this matter. By the way, it's just, uh, I just need to note because we don't often get to see the pretrial litigation in cases. Normally there's not a public interest until there's a trial. This is what a lot of practice looks like. Empty courtroom, you and the other lawyers, and that's it. Not a camera crew, not an audio crew, not an audience. This is what most, um, most law practice looks like in criminal court sometimes the courtroom could be a bit fuller because there's so many cases in court in a day but this is generally what it looks like empty courtroom and just you know y'all trying to do your job the prejudice your honor that was present at the time that this court we believe appropriately severed the case uh, haunted the Criminal charges against Paul were dismissed. This attorney is talking about the civil liability for Paul's estate. That just got dismissed on Friday when this hearing happened. Paul was still, Paul's estate was still a defendant in this civil liability. So I'm gonna answer that when we get to Q&A after this, but we heard Mark Tinsley address that at the beginning of the hearing, that Paul's estate is no longer part of this case in the wrongful death case, cause there is nothing there. There's no money in Paul's estate, so they are are taking it out. All right, let's see how the court flip-flopped on their rulings. That's unusual that that happens. So severed Parker's away from the Murdochs is still present. It's worse. Um, in criminal, that's true, but estates can be held liable for things that happen during, um, for things that happen during life. But as we heard Mark Tinsley say, there is no real estate. Paul's estate did not have funds that would make it worth them continuing to pursue the wrongful death action against Paul's estate. And more importantly, with all these dismissals, it's more concentrated, Your Honor. We have one co-defendant, a convicted murderer, who's convicted of murdering his wife and his son, the person, his son, who was Timmy that night and drove that boat and ultimately killed Mallory B. For those of you that aren't familiar with the name Timmy, I don't know if that is a South Park reference or not. I don't know how Paul Murdaugh ended up getting the name Timmy when his um, evil alter ego came out when he was drinking, but that is what his friends called him when he was drinking. He was no longer Paul. He had this 
personality change when he was drinking. Um, and that's why he's saying he was not Paul that night. He was, he was Timmy. That's what he's talking about. The court may recall that when we argued the first severance motion, there was the law that talked about separate and distinct uh, claims. And again, I'm not here to repeat all the, the laws the same, Your Honor. Uh, the rules and the laws are the same. It's just the application of those rules and the laws now are certainly different. On page four, Your Honor, of your order, You I'm wrote quote very curious about this clear that is a motion that is an order that I heard a motion to reconsider <coughs> on uh, I looked further at the law and the motion and everything that had been filed in that and case and the facts of the case and I did uh, so and, and, and I, it's fine with you to keep referring to the order yes sir but uh, the court reversed its yes, ruling uh, and uh, and um, and did not sever the case. Correct. All right, go ahead. Yes, sir. And, and to put that in context, Your Honor, when you did first look at it, this was the order, and I want to put it in the context now of why when you look at that same law and you look at the same facts and things that have changed, why going back to your first order makes perfect sense to sever away from the only remaining co-defendant who's Alec Murda. But on page four, Your Honor, it says there uh, in the first paragraph, uh, five lines up. It says, further, plaintiff's claims against Parker's are separate and distinct such that plaintiff may fully try her case against Parker's during a trial separate from the Murdoch defendants. Now, that was back when it was all of the Murdoch defendants. Now, it's just Ellie. So, if we look at that issue, Your Honor, as separate and distinct, at this point in time, uh, we have Parker's and Ellett murder. There are different claims and different allegations as to those two defendants. And I remember, Your Honor, when I first got involved in this case, it seems like forever ago, but, but I remember, Your Honor, saying we're going to treat this. Uh, the boat crash happened in February of 2019. So when they're talking about this feeling like forever ago, these lawsuits were initiated in March of 2019. That's when the estate first sued, the end of March 2019. It's just like a dram shop case. Uh, and this was before Alec Murdoch had even been, in, I think he was maybe indicted, he had not been convicted of murder, but we're going to treat this as a, a dram shop case. At this point, Your Honor, the claim against Parker is just pretty simple. It's plain and simple. It's whether or not the, the transaction that happened at Parker's uh, which we believe followed the law, uh, that she checked the ID of, Par of, of Paul, uh, thinking that it was um, Buster. She looked at it, she scanned it, and she made a valid legal transaction. We're not here to talk about all the facts of the case, but that's really it. They're alleging that that was not done appropriately. That is it. And whether or not that, whether or not that alleged negligence was a cause of Mallory Beach's death. Eight I see a lot of questions in the case about the dram shop case, dram shop. It's whether or not someone who sells liquor or sells alcohol can be liable for injuries that that person causes. So this is if a bar over serves someone who's intoxicated and then that person goes and gets into a vehicle and kills someone, can the bar, the corporation that owns the bar or the person that owns the bar be responsible and if um if alcohol is sold to a minor can they be held responsible for injuries that that person then causes so um this is i mean this is essentially a boating this is a boating under the influence that caused a crash so can you hold just the person responsible or can you hold the person that sold them the alcohol responsible so that's the dram shop liabilities um and those laws vary jurisdiction to jurisdiction i had a very tragic dui case that kind of involved this at a uh drinking after a company christmas party and whether how responsible the company was um
in the civil context was running alongside of the criminal prosecution of the driver. Nine hours later, uh, after they had gone to the oyster roast and all the other things, and gone to Luther's. He's arguing that there's circumstances again, in between. I'm not here to talk about. Because alcohol was sold at the liquor. It's not a liquor store. Alcohol was sold at Parker's, which is more of a gas station. And I keep saying liquor. I, I realize in the South that you can't just go buy liquor most places. So we're talking about like beer um, that was sold. But then they also went to like a clam bake. And then they also went to a bar and like went into a bar and sat down and had drinks at the bar. So he's also arguing that there were some intervening things that happened. Like Parker's is at the front of the transaction, alcohol was purchased, then they went to like a house party, then they went to another bar and drank at the bar, and then they got back into the, um, then they got back into the boat and then the accident happened. So they're saying that there's a, a long series of events that happened there debate all the facts with you. It's about what the allegations are. So the allegation is, is that that transaction should have been done differently. But if you look at what the claims with the only remaining defendant, co-defendant, Alec Murdoch, they are that, and this is in the um, amended complaint, Your Honor, on page nine. Um, does Your Honor have a copy of that? I have that. If I do. I have it. Okay. On page nine of the complaint, and according to Google, since you might be interested, 43 states have dram shop laws in effect, including Delaware, Kansas, Louisiana, Maryland, Nebraska, Nevada, South Dakota, and Virginia. Um, so there's that. So I guess if you if you work at a bar or somewhere that sells alcohol, you would be more aware of that in your jurisdiction. But if you look at what the allegations are now. Which might be why they stopped at Parker's. Alec Murdoch, it's that he, Willing, willfully allowed his minor son, Paul, uh, under the age of 21, to use Buster's driver's license. That he failed to supervise Paul when he knew or should have known that Paul was using Buster's license. That he gave him a credit card to illegally purchase alcohol. That he negligently entrusted him with a boat when he, Alec Murdoch, should have known that Paul drank to excess uh, and was an unfit, inexperienced, or reckless boat rider. So it's a transaction versus essentially bad parenting. And knowledge that Alec Murdoch had about his own family. Not knowledge that Tahisha Cohen, the customer service rep, would have had, or Parker's, but what was it bad parenting, negligent parenting, negligent supervision? Those two claims are absolutely 100% different. And the evidence and the way that the trial would move forward would be absolutely different against Alec Murdoch as it would be for Parker's. It's a cleaner case, Your Honor. It's a clean case. It's a dram shop case if you want to, uh, uh, as far as the claim against Parker's. The claim against Alec Murdoch it's is messier. the media frenzy. It's a separate claim. And Your Honor, if you go back and look at the law again, that is one of the main things that they were. Buster already settled in this case. Um, so Buster, Buster already settled out of this case. Buster's not who they really wanted to go after. Um, Buster doesn't have the deep pockets. And in civil law, the deep pockets are a big part of it. And that is a strategic decision. So that is part of it. What we're talking about in the cases is that it needs to be separate and distinct. And those are separate and distinct. Now, Your Honor, one of the things that you had mentioned, um, and I remember this from the motion for reconsideration, um, was how does this severance impact joint several liability? Um, this court is, I think everyone is very well aware about why, why Alec Murdoch and Parker's are the only two remaining defendants at this point. Though they have the this most joint money. several liability. It's in South Carolina, if and that's what Parker's just said, is found 1% at fault, they're going to pay the entirety of the verdict for the sins of the Murdochs. And that is the point that they are trying to separate this as much as they can. What he just said was 
when we get to liability, right, you get pers- proportional liability, joint and several liability. So what he said is in South Carolina, if Parker's is even 1% at fault, it's joint and several liability. And Parker's still has money and the Murdoch's don't. So if you put them all to trial together and a jury is empathetic to the Beach family, which they are going to be, and they lump them all in together, then Parker's is going to end up bearing the weight of the liability. And if a jury looks at Alec Murdoch and is like, you know how we can say fuck you loudly? Millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. And so Parker's doesn't want to be jointly and severally liable for Murdoch's money. So that's exactly why he's arguing, Your Honor, you've got to take this apart. And that's why they're there. Your I Honor, mean, he's not wrong. Th- that's law. That's that's part of the strategy of civil fought law. hard to tether us back to Alec Murdoch and the Murdochs for one reason, and that is to infuriate a jury, to get a jury mad at Alec Murdoch and everything that surrounds Alec, the murders and everything else, to get a jury infuriated with him and then have Parkers pay for it. Your Honor, it's a good argument. In looking at joint and several liability, we now know that, and, and Mr. Mr. Tinsley just admitted it, we filed a lawsuit against the estate of the driver of the boat that killed Mallory Beach because we wanted to make sure they weren't hiding money and, and, and this is all about money. Shuffling money around in an inter- Nothing brings back Mallory Beach. And this is the thing with civil cases. The way that we deal with, with civil cases is a harm has been done, and generally, here is the money to fix it. Sometimes you can stop action. Um, sometimes you can get people to never do a thing again. But that is often not the case in civil. Most of the time, civil takes the harm that was done, and then they apportion it out in money. It doesn't ever fix anything, but that is the equation here. And that's what we're seeing Mark Tinsley talk about, and that's what we're seeing this attorney talk about. Look, this is an equation about money. Nothing is gonna undo this situation, but who is going to pay? And Mark Tinsley got up there and said, we're dismissing Paul. We wanted to make sure that Alec Murdoch wasn't hiding money in Paul's estate. And so we are we brought Paul in to try to find where the money was, and there's no money there, and we're letting it go appropriate way that there are no assets but the minute they found out that wasn't there it wasn't about seeking justice from the person who who killed Mallory Beach it was about the money because and and Mr. Tinsley just dismissed him and the court's going to execute that order and 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 then the estate of Paul Murdoch's gone that's what's going to happen they've settled with some of the people from Luther's and um Luther's is the bar so for those of you asking about the bar the bar has settled or the bar's insurance company has settled. The the Woods family, the Oyster Rose, the, the trust, they've settled with all those people. They've settled with everyone else. Your Honor is Alec very well aware that Alec Murdoch doesn't have any money. Your Honor's been in charge of the proceedings re, uh, regarding the receivership. the receivership. So essentially, the, court knows the reason no why there. Mr. Tinsley has fought so hard to keep Alec in this case is because we now have a 100% judgment-proof co-defendant who's murdered his wife, murdered his son, and he wants us there together so that a jury can get angry about that, and the only person who could pay for it is the deep pocket parkers. Your Honor, the point of joint and several... I don't disagree with him. ...liability is not punitive in nature. And what I mean by that is that joint and several liability is for the the Beach family to get a fair trial and to be compensated if a jury believes that Parker's was negligent. At this point, we know that there can be a fair trial against Parker's. It's a dram shot case. It's one that Parker's is prepared to defend. 
And if a jury believes that, uh, that Parker's was negligent and, there's, and that that negligence was a uh, proximate cause of Mallory Beach's death eight, nine hours later, then the jury can render that verdict and subject to any appeals and things like that. There is a company um, that they could seek damages from. But to tether Alec Murdoch and the Parker solely for the reason, solely for the reason of getting that jury infuriated is not the purpose of joint and several liability whatsoever. It's not punitive in nature. Severing Parker's away from Alec Murdoch, Your Honor, would allow a jury to address the dram shop part of it. That's what this case is about as far as Parker's. It is not about bad parenting. So how much can Parker's be responsible and, and to what percentage of liability and what amount of liability they want it severed so that there is no joint and several liability between them and Alec Murdoch. If there is joint and several liability between them and Alec Murdoch, Parker's stands to lose tens of millions plus plus of money. And that is why this is such a large argument. Your Honor, it's such an important argument. The liability I guess it's big. It's that Alec Murdoch it's, is being alleged to very have important. had in this case is indirect. I think he's arguing it very well. To anything related to the transaction and all of the events thereafter, it's indirect. I like this attorney. Nice Where was he in the criminal case, way. sir? We, we like know how that you is argue. The only reason why Mr. Tinsley wants Alec Murdoch in this trial. You make sense. Is is to is for that jury. The jury to see him, and and we just we just saw. I mean, he was convicted of murder in a very short period of time. There's a lot of people who have strong opinions about it. Um, Agreed. And and your honor, I would say this that, um, you know, when we and, and there's a little bit of overlap with the motion to transfer venue, your honor. So I won't argue that completely at this point. But but when you talk about when you talk about uh, during jury selection, uh, you know, if you're asking jurors questions and you say, hey, this case is about a breach of contract or it's a dog bite case, that's one thing. This is a case involving a family and now a, a gentleman who's sitting in jail for the murder of his wife and his son with centuries, uh, centuries of, of the Murdoch influence here in Hampton County. Many times good, more recently bad. Everyone has a strong opinion about it. <laughs> yes, there are strong opinions about it. And there is simply, this court is well aware, Your Honor, the number one goal of the judicial system here is for each party, and that's not just the plaintiff. Each party, including the defendant, and that includes Parker in this case, to get a fair trial. Your Honor, I think that the... Uh, we can't use the audio system here, uh, but I do want to play this one. Uh, hopefully, the court can hear it. Oh, what are we but playing? This is just to put it in context. What As are we you playing? Know, I mean, there's a lot of media here. There's media Sir? right outside of the court. S Sir, this is where you've lost me on your argument. There's a lot of media here. Where? 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 I guess any media would be a lot when you don't normally have media on a case. But where I see I see some cameras and like three people. But okay. House, um, a lot of interviews being given about <laughs> the this judge case. is like. Mm. But as it relates to this very issue of severance, Your Honor, where uh, I'd like the court to hear this from Mr. Bland, Eric Bland, who was involved in Satterfield. What? Wait a second. Wait a second. Where is it? Where is where's my where's my damn record scratch? How does Eric Bland get brought into every single proceeding? These lawyers are so big mad. The judge is the judge is like, mm. 
why are you bringing Eric Bland into this? Eric Bland is not involved in the Beach case. He's involved in the Satterfield case. I am I I was not expecting that at all. To all of the members who were like, please cover the Mallory Beach hearing. Thank you. The the judge is like, how is this relevant? From Mr. Bland, Eric Bland, who was involved in the Satterfield matter. Uh, go ahead and play that. How? What? Intoxicated or watercraft. And uh, it's going to be a fascinating trial if Alex Murdoch uh, does come to the trial. You know, he's sitting at the defense table with Parker, which means he's going to get the stink. Parker's going to get the stink all over him from Alex Murdoch just being two feet from him. In a wait, 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 wait. What in the fucking inception is happening? I'm going to back this up. But it looks like that attorney is holding up a laptop for the court, playing a video of court TV, playing Eric Bland, either talking to court TV or on his podcast, talking about court TV. So we are on, we are watching a stream from court TV of a court hearing, wherein now they are using for argument a clip from court TV. <laughs> what is happening the chat's right at least bubba's not getting blamed i mean that's fair but you can clearly see the court tv logo down at the bottom of the laptop <laughs> i feel like we're in courtception okay let me back up so we can hear all of eric bland's statement i don't see eric bland sitting in court which actually kind of surprises me did he know he was going to get brought up probably not he's had a lot going on it seems just from following the socials Eric Bland, who was involved in the Satterfield matter. Uh, go ahead and play that. <clears throat> Intoxicated or watercraft. And uh, it's going to be a fascinating trial if Alex Murdoch uh, does come to the trial. You know, he's sitting at the defense table with Parker, which means he's going to get the stink. Parker's going to get the stink all over him from Alex Murdoch just being two feet from him in a jumpsuit. I'm not sure they're going to let him wear a suit a business suit uh they may um but just the fact that you're at the same defense area or table with alex Murdoch will really uh resonate with the jury you have about 30 seconds yeah I, I'm, I'm well aware of that i don't um, i mean I, i'm aware of that <laughs> the court's like uh, the purposes of this hearing today i'd rather not hear any videos of other lawyers giving their opinion about the case. I'm well aware of where we are, so let's don't. <laughs> I'm well aware of where we are, he says. Oh my God, the judge. But they, that sounded like an Eric Bland appearance with Vinnie Palatin on, on closing arguments is what that sounded like. There's the rest of the media sitting in the jury box, but that's what that sounded like. That is really very inception-y. Have any more of those? Yes, sir. Uh, Let's not have I, any I, more I will, of those. I will say this, and um, as far as um, the stink, that's what this that's what this court should be concerned about. It's the reason why Sorry, we filed this motion to. to sever. Circumstances have changed, Your Honor, um, and and we are here to get a fair trial for Parkers. And so, Your Honor, based on the change in circumstances, the applicable law. The claims that are remaining uh, and the clear prejudice that uh, that Parker's would face being tethered again to to a convicted murderer, we would ask that this court sever Parker's away and let us try our case against with the Beach family. Thank you, Mr. Tinsley. Your Honor, I can't pass up this opportunity, and I suspect that no one's ever quote. I suspect that Mark Tinsley has never passed up an opportunity for an argument in court. The judge is fixing to say something, but I suspect that Mr. Tinsley has never passed up an opportunity to make an argument ever. Hold on just a Mr. Cook, you want to take a spot up here inside the bar? <clears throat> thank you. Another attorney just showed up, the attorney right, for you're good. Murdoch. Murdoch. Mur yeah, thank you, Your Honor. I, I suspect no one's ever quoted Pee Wee Gaskins to you before, but I'm going to quote him now. Who's Pee Wee Gaskins? Fairness and justice are dependent on your perspective of whether you're giving it or you're getting it. And if you look at, and I'm not going to go back through our whole motion to reconsider in the brief, I extensively briefed everything he's just talked about, but I'm going to point out a few things. 
Go ahead, Martin. You Martin's can't link. come in to a situation, a case, pour gasoline on something, set it on fire, step back, and then claim that you have unclean hands. In the motion uh, to disqualify me, I filed with your honor the blog, the 28-page blog that, that Greg Parker's employee filed and, uh, and made public in July of 2021, after the murders, containing blog? inside information only available to the lawyers. There was a blog? There was a 28-page blog? I What blog? Mr. Parker has sat with the Wall Street Journal. He sought the Wall Street Journal out to make this subject. Why is it always the Wall Street? Why is it always the Wall Street Journal? Isn't it always the Wall Street Journal? Isn't it always? Isn't it always the Wall Street Journal? I did not have Wall Street Journal causing problems on my bingo card today. The, the focus of worldwide attention. He sat with Dateline. He sought them out. He sat with Netflix. He sought them out to give his statement. To the extent that they argue there's some change in circumstances and they don't, they have unclean hands and all this attention, the facts don't support that, Your Honor. And there's no evidence in front of you that would support that conclusion. And that's the, really the point. If you look at, for instance, um, Smith versus Tiffany, every single case that's cited in the brief before where a defendant claims that the 200 years of settled law in this state, that the plaintiff is the architect of her complaint, of her case, of how she presents her case when it's an indivisible injury, like a death, and, and common issues of, of questions of law and fact, and they are in fact that, that, that she gets to decide. She are they common interest? This, and I like Mark Tinsley, are they actually common questions of law and fact? And this is the question that this judge is going to have to deal with. Because I can see the argument that even though it's all related to the boat case, you could go to trial on just the Parker's bit and argue the dram shop, argue whether the cashier checked the license properly and it's a legit license, but it's not this person's license and whether or not they're responsible for what Paul did or whether that liability is limited by all the other things that happened that night and the fact that before he got back in the boat the final time he had gone to a bar and whether that intervenes and all the rest of it. Those are the questions of law and fact for Parker's. But the questions for law and fact as to Murdoch are whether he knew about Paul's drinking, whether he knew how much his underage son was drinking, whether he knew that he was capable of driving a boat at night, yes or no, whether he knew he had his brother's license. Those are different questions of fact, I think, that go to Murdaugh than go to Parker's, and I can see how you can easily go to trial on the two separate things. Tinsley has to argue, well, these two things go together. It is a series of events, um, but Parker's doesn't know there's no allegations that Parker's knew Paul or or that a cashier at Parker's should know his drinking habits or his behavior or, or whether he can drive a boat. Their job is to check the license and make sure that the person on the license is the person in front of them. That's their job. He is the architect. In every one of those cases, the Supreme Court has addressed this idea that there's some unfairness. We there's a have stink. a system that encourages the resolution of lawsuits. They have the keys to the jail. The fact that he refuses to avail himself of it is, is exclusively Mr. Parker's making. There's simply no evidence before this court to support any conclusion that he's argued. Alec Murdoch's great-grandfather, Alex Murdoch's grandfather, Alex Murdoch's father are right here. He's pointing the Alex Murdoch is not sitting on the side of the plaintiff. And Alex Murdoch is not conceding liability. He is contesting and fighting liability. And only Mr. Parker thinks that the funds in the receiver account are judgment proof or nothing. Any risk of prejudice in this case from Alec Murdoch's involvement in this county where people still may believe the, that he was wrongfully uh, accused, edit. he was convicted of murder because he was in fact guilty. And there is no basis for this court to conclude any prejudice either to Parker's or to Ellick as Parker's a result is like, of that. But Eric if he Bland can get a said, fair and impartial trial in Colleton County, which is in the 14th Circuit, which is affected with the same influence that they argue that this case is infected with, he can get a fair trial here. They will get a fair trial. I'd submit to the court 
that the prejudice is more likely to the plaintiff than it is to the defense by Alec Murdoch's involvement in this matter. But there's no evidence of that, Your Honor. And they can stand in here, and much like they're going to do with the motion to transfer venue, there simply is no evidence. And they can't show that. Smith versus Tiffany, and I've cited it to you before, it's 419 South Carolina 548, 2017 Supreme Court opinion. The Supreme Court recognized that you cannot, the court cannot usurp the judiciary's, I'm sorry, the legislature's authority to enact policy. And in this case, because we have the um, contribution among joint court feasors section that specifically makes joint and several liability, but still the law of this land. Joint tort feasors just simply means the joint actors that did the tort. So this is civil cases. This is a civil case. We're talking about torts, not criminal liability. So that's what the joint tort feasors are. It's like, this is a chain of events and y'all are joint tort feasors. That's what the legislature allows for. The judge can't override what the legislature does. So that's where we're at. And which has been the law for over 200 years. They are asking you to violate the separation of powers. And the Smith case recognized that that is an additional gone, basis in big addition argument. to the 200 years against of authority the Constitution, that, Your Honor. that the plaintiff gets to make the decision. And these are the same issues. They blame the Murdochs. They say Paul Murdoch is not the driver. All of these issues are common issues. And you cannot now, I thought it was interesting that he stands up and he tells Your Honor that the law and the facts are the same. But just there's a change in circumstance, there's no change in circumstance. And now, in their brief, they seem to be proposing three trials. The Morrow case, I cited it to you, Your Honor, before, Morrow versus Fundamental Long-Term Care, 412 South Carolina 534, 2015 Supreme Court opinion. That was the case where the, the trial court said that, in the, and this is a nursing home neglect case, in the first instance, we have to decide whether there was neglect. If there's not neglect, for which the nursing home company can be vicariously liable, there can't be liability for its own corporate acts. It's the same thing here. And the Supreme Court found that not only did that view of the claim, the plaintiff's claim, violate the plaintiff's Seventh Amendment right to a jury, but it in fact upset this 200 years of settled law that the plaintiff is the architect, and it runs the risk of potential inconsistent verdicts. He's arguing the plaintiff is the architect saying the plaintiff gets to choose. The plaintiff gets to choose how they go about a case, not the defendant. Beyond that, Your Honor, they continue to talk about Rule 20, but they're not asking you to sever it now. They're putting that label on there, and the Morrow case says you can look through that label. What they're asking you to do is bifurcate this, and it is improper under Rule 20, it's improper because, again, I argued to you before, a claim, their defense's claim, blaming Paul Murdoch or saying that he's not the driver, is in fact a claim broader than the right to relief referenced in the rule and makes Rule 20 inapplicable. If you look at page... So he's saying that the Parker's defense means that they all need to be tried together because the Parker's defense is going to be well, the liquor might have been sold to Paul Murdoch, but we don't even know if Paul Murdoch was driving. So that's part of what they are, are dealing with here. 13 of the motion to reconsider, that whole page is about the subject, Your Honor. I don't need to recite it now, but Rule 20 is inapplicable, Rule 42 is inapplicable, because these are the same issues. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. All right. Tinsley uh, got to the point pretty quick. If you have something new to offer, I mean, I, you know, <laughs> the, the court has been through this in prior hearings. There's been lots of briefs filed. If you have something. The court's ruled on this. The court's ruled on a motion to reconsider this and is now ruling on it, you know, thrice. So the court's like, new. New that you'd like to uh, respond to, I'll be glad to listen to you. Yes, sir. Very briefly, uh, Mr. Tinsley has said that the plaintiff is the architect of of her, his or her complaint and, and, and would argue to this court that the, they're allowed to do whatever they want and the court can't have any control over it. If that was true, if the plaintiff is the architect of the complaint, 
outside of the available rules that this court has, how on earth would there even be a rule to sever? It, 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 it doesn't make sense. Yeah, they could sue whoever they want to, but the court has the, the discretion to say, hey, in this case, you could sue whoever you want to, but our the role, can sever it. our role as the court is to make sure that whoever you're suing is getting a fair trial. And I'll lastly say, Your Honor, Mr. Tinsley said there's no change in circumstances. I would beg to differ that a conviction Murdoch getting of murder convicted is a change. of your wife and your son is certainly a change of circumstance from the first from the first. However, a change of circumstance that you can voir dire around with the jury and might not be relevant to come up in this case. I mean, it might come up in this case because it's like, well, we should just be able to ask Paul. Well, you can't. Why? Because one of the defendants killed him. That's why. Seven. Thank All you. right. Thank you. All right. Now let me hear you on your motion for uh, change of venue. Change of venue. Yes, sir, Your Honor. Change of venue. Um, means as I mentioned, us, uh, change of venue means let us do this elsewhere, please, Your Honor. Your Honor. We can't do this shit here. Can you please let us do it somewhere else? How nice is it to have a courtroom with like windows? <laughs> I never practiced in a courthouse that had a courtroom that had windows to the outside, um, ever. Uh, you know, the, the motion so to lovely. sever and the, and the basis for the motion to sever are also somewhat intertwined and overlapped with the motion to transfer, Your Honor. Uh, under uh, South Carolina Code 157 100 uh, where can they go? I don't uh, know where they recognize that this is in the discretion. Of the I don't court. know where they want to go. Uh, your, uh, your Honor may be uh, out familiar of this that originally uh, there of was a uh, motion to transfer uh, in January of 2020. That motion was based on convenience of witnesses. Uh, this motion, as Your Honor is aware, is for prong two, which talks about the ability to get a fair and impartial trial. So it's different from the first one. I think some people have said, well, you filed it before. Uh, what's different? But it's a different motion, Your Honor, as, as you know. Uh, Your Honor, per that rule, you have to get an affidavit uh, from a Hampton County resident uh, to say that they uh, believe that you cannot uh, get a fair and impartial trial here. And that was, that's not easy to do. Uh, we were able to get two. Uh, I understand that Mr. Tinsley just this morning, uh, right before the hearing, has something to suggest that one of the um, one of the uh, folks who gave an affidavit, Miss um, Brown, may not have property here in Hampton County. She uh, she reported that she lives here part of the time. But more importantly, Your Honor, um, we have the affidavit of. Mr. Rant, who's been a um, resident of Hampton County for 60 years. And the point of the affidavit is to is not to go and talk to every single uh, resident of Hampton County, because there's a lot of people don't even want to talk about this. But the affidavit gives you the, the ability to at least file the motion, which is what we've done. Your Honor, we do believe that the Notoriety, I was talking about jury selection. Now, again, in this case, in this county, we know the Murdoch name has influence. Everybody's going to have an opinion one way or the other, whether it's good. If it's one way or the other, then it can either help you or hurt you. Or bad. But there is an opinion. And again, Your Honor, it would be one thing if we're talking about a breach of contract case here and, and the Murdochs uh, may be involved. We are talking about Alec Murdoch, who practiced law here, had a firm here, who is now convicted Whose daddy, granddaddy, and great granddaddy's and photos all hang in this very in courtroom. A trial in Hampton County. Talk about the pictures! There, there is no Please. resident in Hampton County that hadn't heard about it, hadn't talked about it hasn't watched news about it. I think everyone in, in the state honor, talked about this boat crash. That, again, at the time that the first motion was filed, which was for convenience of witnesses, that was at a time when um, Alec had not been uh, indicted, I don't even think. Paul was still alive. Uh, Maggie and Buster and all the other defendants were there. Now, again, we're here with just one co-defendant. And who's a convicted Alec murder? Alec Murdoch. Um, your Honor, we do believe that the case 
of State versus uh, Manny Lee Law, which is 265 South Carolina 111, uh, which is cited. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we anticipate is that when you do transfer venue, uh, that it needs to be moved to a county in the judicial district uh, in the circuit. Um, Your Honor, as you can tell from so our motion, we're asking else in the for it to be circuit. removed from the circuit completely. So they're asking for it to be out of the, the 14th that circuit. Just right down the road in Colleton is where Mr. Murdoch was convicted. Um, and more importantly, Your Honor, what that case stands for is not only that transferring venue is appropriate and within the discretion of the court, but that also the Constitution, uh, the Constitution of South Carolina, uh, first and foremost, requires an impartial trial for the defendant. You've already talked about and how it's Honor, national news. Uh, so Section 23 says it shall be the duty of the General Assembly to pass here, laws for the change of venue in all cases, civil and criminal, upon proper showing, supported by affidavit, that a fair and impartial trial cannot be had in the county where such action or prosecution was commenced. Your Honor, that's the basis for our motion. Uh, again, it's intertwined with our the facts and circumstances of our motion to sever. Uh, we, we believe that, um, and, and I, I do want to say this, Your Honor. Wait, wait, you uh, were wrapping up. Wait, what happened, it is sir? Not, it is not that we don't believe that folks from Hampton County can't be fair. It's the it's type what of case. Again, this is a case about a breach of contract. We're not even having this discussion. We're talking about Ellick Murdoch and the Murdoch dynasty and the Murdoch family here in Hampton County. That's the reason. Not because they can't be fair. It's because they're going. Every juror brings their life experiences to the box, and that life experience here in Hampton County is going to be, to use Mr. Tinsley's term, it's going to be infected with all the stank all of the media hurricane that is the murdochs and so your honor we would ask that there be a transfer venue. it's now a media Thank hurricane you. it is, it is you. we have moved on from a a clout circus that's a different case to a media hurricane and the judge is like before i get to you yes your honor tell me mr tinsley mr cook I'm going to listen to Mr. Tinsley and then I'll give you an opportunity to respond. I did, I cut you off and didn't hear you on the first motion. I'll hear you on uh, both motions after Mr. Tinsley finishes. Mr. Tinsley. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Tinsley. Uh, I love the accents in South Shear, Carolina so much. Uh, I love them. The rule requires an affidavit. I do. Uh, the, the, the rule, the law, uh, the Constitution require a formidable showing, a show. This is the second time Tinsley has started his argument with the Constitution. Your Honor, the Constitution. Knowing that it is truly impossible. This is Austin versus Black River Electric Co-op, 345 South Carolina, 323 South Carolina, South Carolina Tinsley Supreme Court Dasani? opinion from 2001. Oh, Tinsley, sir. It's truly no. impossible to strike a jury uh, in which the jurors, the venari, will either say that did he just say veneer venari okay tinsley we're gonna have to have a conversation because i because this is a a, a a local pronunciation of veneer that i have not heard before they will follow the law say that they will abide by their oath and follow your honor's instruction tinsley we would like to get you some an affidavit water. he says in the fill in the blank affidavit they got from he he said mr rant it's gerald brant I know Mr. Brandt. Um, even if you were to consider this I affidavit, just don't, I just don't let like me jump back to Ms. Brown. Ms. Brown, me. in the fill in the blank it's affidavit, it says that she's a resident because that's what Mr. Shearer wrote on it. But then she had the wherewithal on the last page to say, well, she lives in Florida. She's got some property here. It's not uncommon that people have hunting property here and they're up here periodically. And, and she watched it on the TV and, and she knows what she knows. There's no evidence there. Mr. Brandt's affidavit uh, is equally 
unable to There's establish a, any of the formidable a large robin obstacles he has around outside my to window. establish. And if you look at the case of Stevens versus the Sun News, the Supreme Court talked about uh, what a formidable burden that is. And it was in the context, in that case, they actually used. Why is the judge's blink rate so high? The judge is like, please stop. I get it. It's all in your motions. Remember, all of this is in writing. Um, also, the Dasani shade. I'm not shading you if you like Dasani. I personally, of all of the bottled waters, I hate Dasani. I do. I hate I hate Dasani. And the other table has Aquafina. So so Dasani can't be the only option. Um, but I, I just I have a personal and strong dislike of Dasani. When people are like, I'm like, can I get some water? And they're like, we have Dasani. I'm like, no. <laughs> it's like when you order a Coke and they're like, is Pepsi okay? No. No, it's not. No. No, it's not. No, it's not. I just... I, Attorney affidavits. They used the senator's affidavit. Uh, and it talked about the inability of the... Uh, yeah, I don't particularly County like Aquafina To give a either. fair and impartial <laughs> trial uh, to the plaintiff in that case. And the Supreme Court noted that, um, that those statements... The same statements that are outlined in Mr. Shear's fill-in-the-blank affidavit are mere conclusory statements. There is simply no showing. So I would submit to the court that he hasn't even met his initial burden of an affidavit Your Honor, we that haven't you can even consider if you look at uh, the Stevens case. Who keeps Dasani in business? That, All the Honor, companies that have uh, again, he is asking agreements the court to assume that the people of Hampton County will not follow their oath they will not follow the law and and you simply can't assume that the idea that sorry Tinsley we got the, distracted the, by the, your the water world, there's worldwide attention there's nationwide attention there's statewide attention to this where would we try it your honor that's exactly where what would the chat go said and find chat. people who've not heard about it Tinsley Every agrees with you case I've ever tried the court says do you know anything about this do you know anybody in this and then ultimately can you set that aside right and listen to the evidence ask that it comes in from that chair right there ask it in voir dire and try this matter fairly and impartially it may be come august the 15th after we've been through all of the people who i generally up, prefer my water with a bubbles. change of venue mo would be appropriate at that time if we are unable to select 20 People, like a peach period. Which is what the Constitution requires. 20 Amazing. people from which the strikes will be exercised. If we can't find 20 people in Hampton County, and I... <laughs> I think we can. There's no question that we'll find 20 people. There's no question we'll find, I think we'll find more than 20 people in the first panel. But there's no evidence in front of this court that supports this baseless argument that they're making today, and we'd ask you to deny it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cook, on behalf of Alec Murdoch, I'd be glad to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, on, on both motions, on the... Uh... We are now going to Mr. Cook, the attorney for Alec Murdoch, with regard to the motions to sever and the motion for change of venue. The two motions that are pending. Motion to transfer venue, Your Honor, uh, just briefly. Uh, his, his view is that there's really no place in the English-speaking world that you can transfer the case where people haven't heard about it. And uh, reluctantly have to agree with Mr. Tinsley that we're going to have to rely on the... <laughs> well, I have to reluctantly agree with Mr. Tinsley. He really didn't want to do that. <laughs> Lawyers are so funny. Civil lawyers are the best. Um, no, no Poot, Poot and uh Poot and Jim are handling the civil cases. This is this is Alec Murdoch's lawyer handling, or sorry, they're handling the criminal cases. This is Alec Murdoch's civil lawyer handling um the Mallory Beach case. The, the uh, integrity of the jury uh and, and good voir dire and, and jury selection to find a panel that can put aside um the the, the other things surrounding the Murdochs and, and focus just on the facts of this case. So uh, for that reason, we have not joined in that motion to transfer venue. As to the motion to sever, Your Honor, um, the, one, the one, one interest we have is that we believe that under the Contribution Among Joint Tort Feasers Act, Mr. Murdoch is entitled to have his liability, if any, reduced by the uh, liability of others. 
Parkers can't because their liability arises out of the sale or use of alcohol, and that's one of the exclusions under the under the act. But interesting. Uh, we're take the position. So he's arguing that under the Joint Tort Feasers Act, like we did this shit together, Alec Murdoch's entitled to have his liability reduced by the liability of Parkers. So Murdoch is siding with Tinsley in this motion. Murdoch doesn't want this severed. Murdoch's like, Murdoch as a joint tort feaser has the right to say, yes, Murdoch might be liable, but Murdoch's liability is a lower percentage of liability because remember it's civil and we have to deal with math. Um, or maths, we have to deal with that different percentage of liability. So there, Murdaugh is saying, I'm entitled to a reduction in my percentage of liability jointly with Parker's. Parker's doesn't have that option under the dram shop laws because they are um, providing the alcohol. So Murdaugh is siding with, um, Murdaugh is siding with Tinsley and he's like, <laughs> you can tell he doesn't want to do it, but he is. That doesn't apply to Mr. Murdoch. And so it would complicate the trial if you had separate trials with Parkers and, um, and Mr. Murdoch. So for that reason, he opposes the motion to sever. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cook. Interesting. Anything? Any oh, further of course, argument? Murdoch wants Parkers to pay. All right. We're going to take a 15 minute break. Murdaugh, of course, wants Parkers to pay. We're not taking a 15-minute break. We're uh, we're going to zoom, zoom past it. Thank you, Court TV, for putting chapters in here. So whoever whoever did that at production at Court TV, we appreciate you. Thank you. Um, we appreciate it. Let's get to the judge's ruling, shall we? Shall we? I appreciate the arguments that have been made today. And... I just want to remind everybody, Judge Halls had, uh, was appointed this case more than four years ago. I'm well aware of uh, the He's particular like, facts, the positions, the I'm parties well in the case. The lawyers have, up to this point have done a very excellent job of educating Judge Hall on Sorry. the law and areas of the law, and I'm sure that's going to continue going forward. The law is um, the law. Uh, educating me on the issues uh, in, the, in this particular case today after and I've had plenty of time uh, before today in addition to the oral arguments to review all the briefs uh, the rulings I've made in the past the arguments that were made on the briefs the motions that had been filed in the case based upon that uh, on uh, great your honor is about to rule but I want to know how do you get a cool chair like Judge Newman's cool chair, because this chair isn't as cool. Greg Parker's uh, second motion to sever, uh, I deny that motion, and Greg Parker's motion to transfer venue, uh, the court denies that motion as Denied. well. Denied. I want to remind everybody, those that uh, are in attendance, uh, uh, the court certainly doesn't find any fault with attorneys filing appropriate motions. Uh, hearing those motions, they're doing their job. These are excellent lawyers on both sides of this case. Makes it a pleasure to serve uh, as a judge in this type of case. When the you judge get really is just good reminding lawyers. the media. Uh, there's no fault for these attorneys. This is a ruling on the law. This is the judge speaking directly to the media. This is a ruling on the law. These lawyers are doing their job. The lawyers are lawyering. And when the lawyers are lawyering, there is no fault with that. This is how the system works. The lawyers are going to lawyer. They stood up, they argued well. Um, there were there were arguments that Parker's made that are good arguments. Ultimately, the judge is like, the law does not support that argument. And so the judge is reminding the media that this is not a so-and-so lost or so-and-so won or so-and-so is doing better. This is just the law says this and that's what I'm doing. And I appreciate the judge for that. This is not sensational, but this is a hugely consequential ruling because both of those motions are denied. And we're going to get to the impact of that ruling in just a minute filing these motions they're good lawyers doing their job uh, i do uh, believe that the courts in south carolina have had plenty of experience in dealing with very high profile cases uh in the venues the that occurred. Like, certainly the dylan roof case would be a pretty prime us. example of a case that was held in the play in the venue in which the uh, uh the atrocious acts occurred and uh a local jury in Charleston County heard that uh, they gave a fair and impartial 
they were fair and impartial jurors. I'm sure that's going to be the issue in this case. Is I'm sure it's probably the issue over in Colleton County. Uh, the clerk of court is making every effort to provide uh, the appropriate number of jurors. Hopefully, we'll and um, the the court has full confidence that we'll find the way jurors they say here jurors in, in South Carolina. Uh, warms Hampton the County to take their oath seriously. We'll be able to listen to the evidence and based upon the evidence what they hear in this courtroom to render a fair and impartial verdict. So uh, I will simply file a four, two form four electronic orders stating that the both motions have been denied uh, and denied. that will be those will be electronically filed. Thank you. And that's the end of that. Uh, and one other issue uh, I would like uh, some type of pretrial briefs pursuant to uh, Rule 16, Rule of Civil Procedure, that uh, Rule 16C, um, I, I would like those by the end of the month, no later than the end of the month. And I remind you, under that rule, those are briefs for the court. They are not to be filed. They are not a part of the record in the case. But <laughs> the I media ask that both need your sides trial briefs. <laughs> uh, file the appropriate pretrial brief with all the information those required in Rule 16C. And again, I remind you, the rule uh, states that those are not to be made part of the record, uh, not to be published. Uh, they are for the purpose of uh, uh, providing that pretrial information uh, to the court. Have those into my office by the end of the month. At some point in time, we probably need to schedule a uh, status conference on where we are. Uh, I, we won't resolve that issue today, but uh, y'all may want to talk about that among yourselves. Uh, I'm flexible in the the. I'm just uh, waiting for the court to, to the be extent. done. I'm going to be in der several different places uh, doing criminal and civil cases between now and August that would 14th, be so much. but I'll do everything to adjust my schedule I to meet y'all so that I we can't have some type of the jurisdictions where the judges have to do both uh, in person. The laws, in the it's just such Anything a different else? thing. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Mr. Uh, Tansen. Having Mr. to flex Cook, between the two uh, is tough. I just filed a motion for protective order related to Alex Merck's deposition, which is scheduled to take place on Tuesday. Oh. Um, I'd like to take that up. Uh, I have moral objections to the order, and I can explain that. Um, Mr. Murdoch. Yes. Uh, and then they approach regarding that protective order that we covered before this hearing was covered. Um, so they are approaching on the protective order. So let's go to what happened after that hearing. That hearing was on Friday. Parker's, the, uh, the, convenience store that sold the beer to Paul Murdoch was trying to sever the case and change a venue. When that did not happen, I imagine the conversation was immediately that um, the liability sitting next to Alec Murdoch in this trial was going to be substantial. So let's talk about the news that came out on july 17th what was that monday this looks like it went down late sunday um so on uh i think it came down late sunday but sunday monday either way what we see oh emily switch your screen share hold on is that parker's settled this case for 15 million dollars why did parker's settle this case now because of that ruling, because of that ruling, that ruling is what facilitated this settlement. So this settlement came down after the weekend, <clears throat> I think because Parker's knew that once, once they had to go to court and sit next to Alec Murdoch, that they potentially faced much greater liability. Again, this is one case this is the case against Parker's the company. This is not the case against Parker the individual. So they said it is better to settle this case. So in Murdoch case settlement, boat crash victim Mallory Beach's family to get 15 million. And that, I mean, the headline is a little, a little misleading for me because this is the settlement with Parker's. The family of 19 year old woman who was killed in a boat crash in 2019, Mallory Beach, her name is Mallory Beach. 
will receive $15 million to settle a wrongful death lawsuit brought against the gas station and convenience store chain accused of selling alcohol to an underage boater, Paul Murdoch. Mallory Beach died after a collision involving a boat owner, a boat owned by former South Carolina attorney Richard Alexander, Richard Alec Murdoch, who was sentenced to life in prison this year after being convicted of murdering his wife and son, Paul. Paul was allegedly driving the boat while intoxicated when it crashed in Beaufort County, South Carolina, in February 2019. The lawsuit, which names Alec Murdoch, Gregory Parker, and his Parker's Corporation, said Parker's convenience store is liable for making the illegal sale of alcohol to then underage Paul Murdoch and for failing to verify his ID or check that it matched the name on the credit card he used to pay for the alcohol. Mark Tinsley, an attorney for Beach's family, confirmed the settlement to the Greenville News, part of USA Today's network, and said his clients want the, uh, want the settlement to send a message. Quote, it wasn't about the money, but that's a number that represents a level of accountability that they hope would make people who sell alcohol take their responsibility seriously and keep it out of the hands of minors. The Beach family didn't want this settlement settlement confidential because they want other Greg Parkers to know that if you sell alcohol illegally, you will be held accountable. So that is why it is not a um, it is not a uh, confidential settlement. So let's see. What does the lawsuit claim? Beach's mother, Renee Beach, filed the first version of the wrongful death lawsuit in March 2019. Several parties were named in the original suit. Most of them settled earlier. Um, everyone settled earlier, except for Alec Murdoch. A court, and Paul Murdoch was just dismissed on Friday. According to court documents, Paul Murdoch purchased beer from a Parker's store using driver's license belonging to his brother. Murdoch was accused of condoning Paul's drinking and reckless boating. Quote, tears were shared in our room with the beaches this afternoon they feel like they have honored mallory by not walking away when it would have been easier to give up tinsley said they've been attacked accused and blamed from an emotional standpoint there's a lot of vindication in this settlement i'm sure there is settlement halts trial but the case is ongoing paul murdoch pleaded not guilty to criminal charges connected to the boat crash but he was killed before he could stand trial the charges against paul murdoch were dropped after his death as a formality the criminal charges but Robert Kittle, spokesperson for the South Carolina Attorney General's office at the time, said the case remained open. The settlement reached Sunday halts the trial, which had been scheduled for August 14th. Tinsley said the settlement does not stop the civil conspiracy and harassment case filed against Parker separately. Quote, we have not settled the conspiracy case against Greg Parker and the other people involved in their vile attacks against the Beach family and their quest to get justice. We intend to hold Greg Parker personally responsible in that lawsuit. This $15 million is against Parker's corporation that's likely going to be paid out by insurance. So this is likely the insurance company at the end of the day saying we're, we're settling. And the insurance company can choose to settle even if uh, Greg Parker doesn't want to. So the Beach family, hopefully, will be able to use the $15 million settlement to pay attorney's fees to keep going after Greg Parker for the civil conspiracy case, which I have not covered yet. But if you want me to break down, hold on, let's put up a poll. Um, and I'm going to ask you, should uh, we cover the other Parker's case? If you guys are curious, I will cover the other Parker's case. So I'm putting up a poll right now. There's almost 10,000 of you here watching. Again, do the YouTube things, but go join the poll. If you're subscribed, you can chat in the chat. And we will talk about that lawsuit. I feel like we're invested in the tentacles of all of these lawsuits. So let me know. Uh, let's see. Alec Murdaugh's lawyers have indicated he plans to settle his part of the Beach family's wrongful death suit. State agents have been investigating whether Murdoch obstructed the criminal investigation into the boat crash. That is a separate, the obstruction case is separate from the wrongful death case. Parker's attorneys say unfairness led to the settlement. Mm. The settlement doesn't require the convenience store chain to admit responsibility in the case. It's a $15 million settlement. It kind of sends a message. On Friday, a judge refused to separate the chain from Alec Murdoch and declined to move the case out of Hampton County. A lawyer for the story said Parker felt as if he had no choice but to settle the case because Alec Murdaugh and the chain would be tied together in the wrongful death suit. The unfairness that caused Parker's insurance carriers to resolve these suits to avoid paying the likely award intended to punish Alec Murdaugh, attorney P.K. Shire Shear said in a statement, adding that he was disappointed Tinsley revealed the details of the settlement 
before it could be approved by a judge. These attorneys, man, are just like, that's civil, man. If you really want to fight with people and send emails back and forth being like, you suck, civil law might be for you. If you love a snappy, snarky email, civil law might be for you. Um, I'm not surprised that this attorney is disappointed. This came out, there is still no settlement um, that I can see filed with the court. I went and looked for it. This was Tinsley saying to the media, this is settled. This is a win. He won in court on Friday and he won again when the insurance company felt forced to settle. And that's why that hearing was so important to um, so important to the Beach family and to Tinsley's case. So with all of that, let's see. Um, I wonder if there's been any official announcement uh, today. I'm going to look real quick and see if there's any official announcement. Um, let's see. No, the only, I'm seeing statements that Alec Murdo's lawyers say he will settle, but I haven't seen any official announcement that it has settled. Maybe I'll just email the lawyers and ask them. I feel like maybe I should just do that more because they respond so quickly. They respond so quickly. Is civil law kind of like high school drama? Like rival high school drama. It's like rival high school drama because you don't have to, well, it depends on jurisdiction. In a jurisdiction like uh, Southern California, where there's tons of lawyers, you might be against each other in one or two cases. It's different in smaller jurisdictions where these lawyers are going up against each other in case after case after case after case. So let's see. Um, I haven't seen anything that officially states that Murdaugh has settled, but if his lawyers are telling the media that they are going to settle, then that is that is likely coming. But that doesn't stop the protective order. Um, they're supposed to be taking Murdaugh's deposition today. So maybe we'll see, maybe we'll see an announcement of settlement later today, maybe later this week, or maybe they're waiting until they take his deposition. I don't know. So um, let's get to questions. You guys have had a lot of questions. I love it. Don't forget again to like and subscribe. We will we will revisit South Carolina. It seems a lot of you want to. We've got um, only a thousand votes in the poll, but almost 10,000 of you here. So a few more of you might want to go and have your voice heard in that poll. And let's get to questions, shall we? Shall we? So again, this is scheduled for trial in August. Alec Murdaugh, Alec Murdaugh's lawyers have told the media that they will settle. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I'm gonna keep an eye on it. They are scheduled for deposition today. Um, a protective order was filed about the deposition. We heard the attorneys addressing that with the court on Friday, right at the end of that hearing. And we will see what happens. I expect that we will see um, more from Mark Tinsley, but I will I will reach out and ask. Um, because why not? Hey, if the lawyers are gonna answer, I might as well just ask them the questions. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being a honored. Let's get to questions. Who will pay Murdaugh's settlement? Well, he has $400,000 in receivership. He doesn't have any insurance left. I saw a lot of questions about Murdaugh insurance. There is not insurance with regard to the boat crash with regard to Murdaugh. We heard about that during the criminal trial, but there is not insurance for Murdaugh for this. So no. Does Murdaugh have any money left? I think there is a trust left when his father died that they can't really get to to use for this so i think there is some money i think he can um i think he can use that for legal fees i would need to think about it more but is there much money left there's four hundred thousand dollars in a receivership um that might be able to be used for this case whether he has money hidden elsewhere i do not know What's the other Parker case? It is a conspiracy and harassment case with regard to the Beach family releasing photos of um, releasing photos of Mallory Beach crime scene photos and other things. So that is there. Um, let's get to some other questions. So how is Parker store owner related to PMPED Parker? Uh, I don't know if they are related at all. I don't know if it's just a common last name. I don't know if Greg Parker is related to the Parker from the law firm at all. No idea. Qu 
question since there are multiple times the kids accessed alcohol why is parker's the only one being sued elizabeth the bar was also sued the person who had the um oyster party or whatever was also sued they all settled much earlier in the case so the only one who hadn't settled at this point was the estate of paul murdaugh that was dismissed out of the case alec murdaugh and parkers those were the only ones but they were all um in civil cases you kind of sue everybody that could be involved and a lot of those settled uh, so yes so would insurance be responsible murdaugh did not have insurance to cover this why didn't parkers just settle it's my understanding from following this case that Greg Parker did not feel that they were responsible here. So that is that is my understanding of why they did not settle it early it or earlier. Jay Ford said, I'm really surprised the USA doesn't have a way around double jeopardy in the UK. If there is substantial new evidence not available when they were acquitted, it's rare, but it can happen. So this goes back to our earlier discussion. No, when it's an acquittal, and double and jeopardy as attached there is that is it is final if um when we see new evidence coming up is at appeal so if somebody's been convicted um and they've appealed and the appeal has been denied they can appeal again if there is substantial new evidence but that's only if they are convicted so substantial new evidence can only help on appeal if you've been convicted substantial new evidence does not help if you've been acquitted because there's no appeal that can happen question how much does the average judge make per hour? This is something that is going to vary jurisdiction by jurisdiction, but these are salaried government positions. So most of the time you can find them on government uh, websites. There's the most of this is public information. So you can find how much judges make. I don't know um, how much judges in South Carolina make, but it's hourly. And then like most government position, most government positions, um, there's generally steps for like how long you've been in that position and and it goes up so all the government salaries would be public so you could find out how much judges in your location make roughly an hour um or not an hour but make annually so that emily what about alec is he still responsible it seems like that's going to settle but if it doesn't then that'll be going to trial if the boat case goes to trial it will be a very it'll be very interesting to see um to see the theories of liability with you knew your son had a drinking problem or you knew your son drank like this or you knew your son was drinking underage or you knew your son were, was doing these things and yet you gave him the keys to the boat or I, I believe Alec was also at the oyster thing where they went to like you knew your kid had been drinking and he was still driving this boat around so it would be what the thing that would be hard about the Mallory Beach civil suit is most of the people the people most impacted Mallory Beach being gone and Paul being accused of driving the boat and being gone are going to be fought over after their death. And that's a hard, it would be hard for Mallory Beach's family to sit through. I imagine it would be hard um, for the surviving Murdaugh's to sit through. So it would be not the cleanest and easiest civil liability um, in that case saying as a parent, you should have prevented this. So we'll see. Um, why is Paul taken out of the lawsuit? Tinsley said at the beginning of the court hearing that we just covered that um, there's no money in the estate of Paul, essentially. So that's, they're taking him out of the lawsuit. There's no money in the estate. What is the point of severance? Laura, this is a great question. The reason they were trying to sever is to get away from Murdaugh, to get away from the stink of Murdaugh, to get away from the potential joint and several liability of Murdaugh so that they, um, they don't have to uh, pay for what Alec has wrought. So if a jury comes back and is like, fuck you, Alec Murdaugh, $50 million, Parker's would be jointly and severally liable, also responsible for that amount of money. And so Parker's, I think, took the strategic option and said, we will settle this for $15 million. We can't go to trial on this. So that that is the point here. Question, dick is poot and poot is dick, but is pickle poot or dick? Pickle, pickle is right now pirate pickle. I don't know where the pickle went. We've been calling the pickle balls in honor of Captain Corey. So that is what we've been doing with the pickle. Some, some balls. 
because we agreed that the pickle's name needed to change per case. So right now, it is a memorial pickle. Um, and we are the pickles. The pickles name currently is in memoriam, um, and so that we are currently calling it pickle balls because not pickle ball, pickle balls, because it's balls because it's funny. Emily, this is for you to get some. Uh, is it Tazo awake tea? I hope you enjoy. I will. I like their chai teas. We're gonna have to do some teas. Salty balls. Are we calling the pickle salty balls? <laughs> Thank you, Megalina. Megan the Moon said, I'm so, so very appreciative to be able to catch a live. I'm glad you're here. Not in the best place mentally. And I really need this, that the Lawnards are good for that. We're here for you. Um, love you. Thanks for helping my brain. You're welcome. You're welcome. And we are here. That is what the Lawnard community is for. And sometimes if you want to go watch the Lawnard community at action, I, on almost every live stream that I've done, the live chat stays there. So you can go watch the chats having conversations um, about it. Weird suggestion, but green, drinking green coffee unroasted worked for me to solve a sensitivity. That's not a weird suggestion. We, we take all the suggestions. Sometimes you just have to ignore sensitivities for your mental health. That's true. We're going to have to, we're going to have to balance it. I have a sensitivity to cats, but my two are my love bugs. I understand that too. Um, how about mushroom coffee? It doesn't taste like mushrooms. I have not tried mushroom coffee, but we'll see. Soy milk is great in coffee. I think I'm going to go coffee, no dairy for a little bit. I guess soy milk is non dairy, but I think I'm going to go coffee with uh, nothing and give it a try. Today was an early day after a late night and I just needed coffee. Uh, coffee alt that brews exactly the same. I have no coffee version, which is fine with my allergies. I'm going to have to check it out. You guys, um, does everyone know she's been on comedy? Oh, um, w talking about ballinger yes i had i had heard a thing or two about that and all of the breakdowns because i had really that was not my corner of youtube and um and i had no idea who uh miranda sings or colleen ballinger was at all i had someone copyright claim a song that was written in the 14th century i had recorded it i finally got the claim removed but it took weeks that's you're like this is not um that you can't own the copyright to this there's no copyright in it stop it and these the these trolley claims are the worst um if he stood in town store and confessed and produced could he be criminally responsible by the book this is from earlier um double jeopardy is double jeopardy so not to a murder uh it it connects to the to the crime and to the victim of that crime Question, is this process to motivate prosecutors from rushing before charging to have enough evidence and then Jeopardy is more motivation for prosecutors to do the right thing? I think I think Jeopardy, when it was conceived um, in the Constitution, was to prevent government overreach so and to protect the rights of the innocent and to protect, uh, really to protect from persecution by the government. That's what my understanding is of the intent of double jeopardy to protect the rights of the accused that doesn't mean it's a question if sarah continues to oh we talked about this earlier it would um it really it's really going to depend on what's said unfortunately that's a it depends lawyerly very situational answer um, my cousin is currently making a YouTube channel using karaoke music in the background. He is singing his own made up lyrics to the actual song. Will he get in trouble for this? It depends on the music because music has copyrights. Music has copyrights separate from the lyrics too. So there is copyright in the melodies and the musicality and copyrights and the other thing. So in trouble is a whole different thing. Could you make money on that as a YouTube channel? Maybe not depending on if the, the, songs get claimed or not it's really really going to depend but parody is protected it doesn't mean you won't have to rev share things but it depends on what in trouble means right so weird al normally gets um permission for parody when was the double jeopardy law crafted with the constitution so with the constitution it is a constitutional right objection if she's um we talked about this earlier so um we covered that on behalf of the Tinsleys in Virginia. We approve of Mark Tinsley carrying the last name. <laughs> love spending the day with you. I love spending the day with you too, Tinsley's Opinions. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we covered that. In Montana, the bartender would be liable last served. They, in civil, they sued everybody, the bar included. 
I'm a bit behind, but in the attorney case, it was a grand jury indictment, not a preliminary hearing. Thank you, Debbie. I was wondering that. And again, I have not taken a deep dive into that case. It makes more sense to me that it is a grand jury indictment. Um, and this is the concern about grand jury indictments when the standard is so low at a grand jury indictment. Do you really have enough um, to go forward? So it's it's an interesting question. And I'll look more at that. Um, Lori, I have no idea what the law says on this. I, I truly don't. I have seen this question be pondered on the internet and the way you would sit down and have a drink and have a ponder about the theoretical, you know, does a life sentence end if you are, you know, revived, but you really aren't a second life. So maybe not. I, I'm sure the law has addressed it at some point. I have no idea. I could give a snarky answer, but I don't think I could give a helpful answer. My question about the Murdoch picks is why does he have a camera in prison? Anyone else wondering? So don't Google, but the Murdoch pictures, um, seem to be from his, his tablet in custody. I don't know if he took them or if he was like video uh, chatting with someone and then they took them, but I don't know who released them or how they got released. If Murdoch was taking those pictures or if they were being taken by the tablet to prove that he's the one using the tablet or whatever, how would those get out unless he sent them to someone? Or was it a video call and who is he video calling that is then screenshotting them and then and then sharing them publicly. Like, how did these get out is what I want to know. How did these get out? How did these get out um, is what I'm more curious about. Shady Millennial says you can have tablets in white collar prison. He is not in white collar prison. Um, Alec Murdaugh has been convicted of, of two murders with multiple life sentences. So he is not in like a federal um, camp. He is in a state penitentiary, but yes, he has the um, tablets. So I don't know how those got out is what I'm more curious about truly and why. Um, so Kimby is saying the tablet automatically takes a picture at login. The tablet was hacked. That's strange. Um, Cause who would hack it and why did they get out? It's just, it's an odd thing. Um, it was released as a FOIA uh, with the call with Buster. That makes sense. Okay, let me get back to the chat on that in a second. Hold on. I was a spiritual witness to a members only live stream where I saw a toxic gossip train crash and I can't get it out of my head. Any advice? <laughs> Mike, I'm sorry. You're going to have to go listen to the dubstep version. It's the only thing that's going to clean your ears or or some Taylor's version. <laughs> what would the Taylor's version of toxic gossip train be? <laughs> um... Melmo, this makes sense to me. Um, I, I Again, I have not researched it deeply. It was released as a FOIA with the call with Buster. If the tablet requires, and it seems um, that the tablet requires like a screenshot to make sure that the person who is using the tablet is like the person whose tablet it is. Because again, you can have circumstances where people are making phone calls where they're using different inmate numbers. That happens a lot where an inmate might use a different inmate number. So you can't easily FOIA the calls um, and you can't and the prosecution and police can't easily find the calls. So if you're if you're Alec Murdaugh and your prison number is like whatever it is and you use your buddy's prison number, then the calls are logged under that prison number, even though you're the one calling. So if the tablet requires it to verify and then the verification was before the video call, I can understand how that might get out. But again, yikes, I didn't want to see it. So Anyway, South Carolina did the tablets in prison for inmates to try to reduce the cell phone smuggling. I, I I can understand. I read somewhere that they were part of a data dump in a response to a FOIA. And this case is going to get FOIA'd over and over and over. Sure I, I, I didn't want to dive too much into it because honestly, I was just like, Whoa. it's like, oh, there's all these pictures of shirtless Murdoch from prison. I'm like, it might be hot in prison. Like, I can understand why he's running around shirtless. I don't want to know about it. Like, I don't want to know about it. Um, if he has a tablet, could he be watching you? I don't know if YouTube is accessible. I think it's pre-approved like videos, pre-approved music and stuff like that. I don't think they have full internet access from the AM funds motion and footnote one lawyers, bad math, 240 hours a week, six weeks is, uh, is 1400 hours, not 14,000 hours. They math super bad. Uh, they mathed in their favor, didn't they? Um, 
<laughs> just too much internet and that's what it is um let's see oh my god you're still live is it time to wrap up oh it's been three hours we well yeah it is it is thank you it was released with a FOIA request by accident South Carolina released a statement about it today oh we're gonna go find that statement hold on thank you Kestrel that's very helpful um leaked I don't want to Google this. I'm doing it for you, chat. This is for the chat. <laughs> Emily becoming a typical streamer. Why did the chat make me do it? Why did the chat make me do it? So they can, they have access to pre-approved like movies, pre-approved music, and then like a pre-approved video calls of like pre-approved in uh, individuals. All right, linked. I like Murdaugh uh photos all right let's see no 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 all of these articles have photos uh, graphic court documents reveal new details of murdoch case <laughs> thank you for fox carolina that had the graphic warning oh that's a different case darn it um let's see those are from something else. All right, y'all. I'm not pulling this up on the screen because the photos are in it. Let's see. In the dozens of images that leaked, a pasty Murdaugh is either donning a white prison issue t-shirt or no shirt at all. Quote, Alec Murdaugh's OnlyFans premiere YouTuber jumpsuit Pablo said in a video just two days ago. I'm just kidding. It's not his OnlyFans premiere, but we have some leaked selfies. I'm sure he didn't want those bad boys getting out. I love that the the uh who is this oh this is for fox news quoting a youtuber um i'm trying to find this statement from south carolina the photos of the 55 year old disgraced attorney who is some who sometimes has headphones on or is caught mid yawn are believed to be taken automatically by the device when he logged on all the pictures were taken from the maximum security prison in south carolina department of corrections in the month of june to show murdaugh's hair has grown back since the first photo of him with a shaved head appeared in march um, the leaked photos come nearly three months after it was revealed that Murdoch was receiving numerous prison love letters, including one from an admirer who says she's been the to told she's the spitting image actress, Jessica Biel. I look, man, I have no words for people sending prison love letters. I don't understand. I don't understand. Um, Fox news digital obtained 86 pages of the emails and love letters in April, which Murdaugh received since his sentencing. Many of his fans sent money to his commissary accounts. Okay. I I don't understand at all. I don't understand at all, but I don't see the statement from South Carolina. So I'll go find it later. Most high profile cases, most high profile cases, there will be love letters involved. It, it there will be love letters involved and it in a high pro that's going to happen in a high profile case i don't understand it i i don't i don't get it i wish somebody would tell me like explain to me why Koberger's getting love letters in prison but the men that are in prison or the women that are in prison that are getting these love letters i can imagine them writing back and being like thank you because a they have connection to the outside world and b they have people to put money on their books i'm not surprised at all i just I don't get, I just don't get it, but, um, so I like Murdoch. Um, I just don't get it. So I don't see a statement. I will keep looking for it. Um, I will keep looking for it, but I don't see anything. Um, I don't see anything about it that says anything about South Carolina. So yeah, so I don't. Again, if those are if those are done through FOIA, they're not. I mean, they're not like leaked per se. They they might have been um, released improperly. I'm sure that Alec Murdaugh feels like his privacy has been a bit violated uh, and doesn't really love that those are all out. But who knows? Maybe it will increase the love letters. It's a strange, strange occurrence. It's just a strange. It's a strange thing. It's just a strange thing. So, um, S said, Hey, Emily, random question. I took the LSAT for fun and got a decent score. Hey, but I don't have a bachelor's degree. Do I need one? If I wanted to go to law school, it depends on the law school. So in some jurisdictions, you are only required to have certain class requirements. Like you had to take these classes 
in some areas you do need a bachelor's degree. It's part of why Kim Kardashian in California is doing the um, apprenticeship route, but it really depends on the jurisdiction and the law school. So I would look where you live and look at what the rules are for going to law school, because if it's just different classes, you can go through and see if you have those classes. Uh, chai is tea. Saying chai tea is saying tea tea. I, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm okay with sometimes being redundant. Um, how are all these lawyers getting paid or is it media attention? Well, in the Mallory Beach case, they're probably going to get paid out of the settlement. Um, Parker's, I imagine their insurance is paying for the attorneys. How are Alec Murdoch's attorneys getting paid? I don't know. But I think Alec Murdoch's attorneys might have gotten paid way earlier because they got paid for the Paul Murdoch boat case, criminal case, and that didn't continue on. I don't think they refunded the Murdoch family. I think they rolled those funds over, so they might have gotten paid there as well. But we'll see what else. Um, Amy said, I had a coworker that married a prisoner. She had a lot of stuff going on in her life, and working on freeing him gave her a lot of direction. Okay. there, There's that. It's just, again, there are things that I can't always um, wrap my head around. Hey, Joe said, fans of someone who killed his wife and son. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, again, he he clearly does have admirers. Uh, again, here's here's what I will say. If your thought about a partner is I can fix them or I can save them, um, maybe just maybe work through that first. Um, or if you want to save people, become a nurse or like a therapist. Like there's a lot of careers where you can save people, but it doesn't need to be the foundation of your relationship. I'm just saying. Um, I can fix it generally doesn't go well. I found, and this is just my own life experience. I've been married for 20 plus years. My spouse is, is somebody who I absolutely adore, but it was never a, um, a I can fix this with my spouse. It was like, we, do this well together. It's like, we are a great team. Um, so I just find that when you go in with somebody and it's like, you are a great teammate. I want to do this life thing with you and you're sexy. It works really well. Find yourself a teammate, find yourself your life partner who is on your team. Like we are ride or dies for each other. We are here for it. Um, and that's what it is. And then you can support one another. But if you are looking for something to fix, I mean, I don't know, maybe a craft project. Maybe not Alec Murdoch. Maybe not Alec Murdoch. Maybe maybe crafting. Maybe some DIYing. I don't know. There's lots of things in this world to fix. Um, but your partner isn't one of them. So, um, <laughs> all right. But I get it. I get the, I get the desire to fix. I get the desire to fix. I'm the only one that understands. I get the desire to fix. I get it. I get it. I get it. Um, so get yourself a teammate that you also think is sexy. There you go. That's my the Emily's relationship advice. <laughs> Do a craft. <laughs> I, Chad, I love you so much. Um, what about Daryl Brooks? I, I don't know if Daryl Brooks has fans in custody. He might. He might. So, you know. Somebody who makes you laugh always helps. All right, y'all. It is um it is time. It is time to say goodbye. Oh, hold on. Hold on. We're we're Judge Abby, I'm gonna call you back in just a second. Hold on, custom. Um, just just she must be on launch from trial stream. All right. Um, y'all, <laughs> I love you. I appreciate you. Lawnards, you are the best. Thank you for being here. Um, I, let me know what your craft projects are in the comments and in the chat. I would love to know what you decide to craft. Um, a new book in a series I very much like got released today. So I'm gonna get some lunchy lunch. I'm gonna get a little snacky snack and I'm gonna put on a book and I'm gonna play a little Tears of the Kingdom and then get the podcast ready for tomorrow. So that's my plan for the rest of the day. All right, oh, we need to end the poll. We need to end the poll. 84% of you want to cover the other Parker's case. All right, I'm going to hold you to it. Thank you, chat. Let us go. Law nerds, you're the best. I'll see you in the next one. You can find all the Law Nerd goodies at lawnerdshop.com. 
connect with me on social media at the Emily D Baker. And don't forget to check out my podcasts, The Emily Show and the new podcast, Quick Bits, summarizing everything I talk about on my Tuesday and Thursday live streams. You know, when you only have time for just the quick bits. <laughs>